Teaching is rewarding because I get to help children. Are, are you ready? Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is David Catania. I'm chairman of the Committee on Health. Today is Friday, March 1st, 2013, and we're here in room 412 of the John Wilson Building to hear testimony from government witnesses on the performance of the District of Columbia Public Schools in fiscal year 2012 and fiscal year 2013 to date. Uh, one week ago, the committee heard testimony from members of the public on DCPS's FY 2012 and 13 performance. The committee appreciates Council Member uh, Chancellor Henderson's in intention to address the issues raised by last week's public witnesses. Uh, the mission of District, public, uh, uh, District of Columbia Public Schools is to, quote, educate all children in the District of Columbia, providing the knowledge and skills that they need to achieve academic success and choose a rewarding professional path. Every day, thousands of teachers and school administrators give great effort uh, to prepare more than 45,000 DCPS students in over 100 schools to become contributing members of society. In my tours of public schools, I've seen firsthand that the district is better off because of the tireless work of many of our teachers, classroom aides, principals, school administrators, and school support staff. Uh, as I stated at our organizational meeting last month, or actually in January, the committee's work We'll focus on three themes, accountability, transparency, and achievement. Accountability means holding everyone responsible for their role in making DCPS a world-class school system. Transparency means fostering a culture of openness and understanding throughout our public education system. And finally, achievement means providing students and adults with resources and tools to become contributing members of the workforce in their community. Uh, these principles will accordingly frame the committee's questions today. Uh, while DCPS is making real progress toward increasing student performance, uh, there's still quite a lot of work to do. The F uh, 2012 DCCAS uh, results indicate that DCPS's overall proficiency rating among our students is 45 percent, uh, 46 percent in math and 44 percent in reading. Uh, and in order to achieve the goal of 70 percent of student proficiency in reading and math by 2017, it will take a lot of hard work, collaboration, and innovation. Um, FY 2012, the FY 2012 revised budget for DCPS was more than $841 million, including $640 million in local funds, $30 million in federal grants and payments, and nearly $40 million in private grants and donations, and $120 million in intra-district transfers. However, that is, uh, that is merely the 30,000-foot uh, and tells us very little about how these resources are being allocated in order to most effectively educate students. Uh, as I've said before, it's my goal to be able to track a dollar from when it enters DCPS as it works its way through the system to a point where it reaches the student. Absent that level of transparency and comprehension, we cannot effectively set priorities or make the strategic investments necessary to realize the significant gains in student achievement that we expect and demand. Uh, I believe that with continued partnership between the committee and the chancellor's office, we can achieve the level of transparency and understanding that the members of the committee and, uh, expect and that the chancellor I know wants to provide. Uh, I would like to thank Chancellor, Hander Ch Chance chancellor Henderson and her staff for, making, uh, for working with the committee staff in the weeks leading up to today's hearing. 
Uh, before we hear from the government witnesses, let me first set the procedures for today's uh, oversight hearings. Uh, council members who are here at the beginning of the meeting will be given a three-minute uh, opening statement, and we will have uh, four rounds of questions, uh, each round being approximately 10 minutes. Uh, Chancellor Henderson, you will uh, have as much time as you need for your opening remarks, and you may call upon your staff as you need to uh, to assist in answering the committee's questions. And I want to thank you uh, again for being here. Uh, before I turn to you, though, I have a, a public service announcement for um, the Duke Ellington School. Uh, this is a continuing effort to promote uh, Duke Ellington. We have on Monday, March 25th, uh, at 7.30 p.m., we will have the performance of the Series of Legends. I believe this is the sixth annual performance of Legends, uh, series the, in the, uh, uh, the Series of Legends uh, at the, the Kennedy Center. Uh, it will be um, at the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. And in order to obtain tickets, you can go to www.kennedy-center.org. Uh, tickets are between $50 and $175, and there are sponsorship levels at $500 and above by calling 202-333-2555, uh, extension 2101. Again, the performance is Ms. Patty LaBelle. She will be uh, performing in a series of legends that benefits the Duke Ellington School of Performing Arts. Um, and this uh, is part of the private foundation money that raises about a million and a half dollars. This is about a, a third of that that helps supplement the, what otherwise is very expensive uh, arts training uh, and resources needed to, to continue the excellent work of that school. So I hope individuals will uh, visit the Kennedy Center website or call Duke Ellington directly so they may purchase their ticket and support the school. Uh, Chancellor Henderson. I see no other. Oh, right. Mr. Grasso, Mr. Grasso, we will have uh, an opening statement in three minutes. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, you know, I, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I don't have an opening statement. I'd like to hear what the Chancellor has to say and have questions for her. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Grasso. Uh, Chancellor Henderson, um, you are joined by Ms. Shepard, who is the uh, uh, your CFO. Uh, do you have any other individuals who want to join you at the table at this point, or do you want to begin your testimony and then call them up as needed? I'll begin my testimony and then call up as needed. Perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, Council Member Catania, Council Member Grasso, and other uh, Council Members that will join us. Thank you for the opportunity to review our performance for the 11-12 school year. I want to be sure to allow plenty of time for questions today, so I'll be brief in my testimony. <clears throat> I do, however, want to respond to some of the concerns raised during the public portion of the hearing to highlight some of our successes and to provide some context for the hearing that we'll have next month regarding the DCPS budget for the upcoming year. We monitored the public hearing last week, and I continue to be encouraged by the level of engagement and energy that individuals bring to this work. While I can't respond to every issue raised in a testimony, I do want to respond to two of the broad themes that we heard consistently through the public hearing. First, we heard a number of concerns about the range of programs offered in our schools. Members of the public expressed frustration about the quality and the equity of our arts education, library services, and foreign language opportunities. These were common themes in the school consolidation hearings, and I'm glad that community members are continuing to advocate for these programs. As is so often the case, the truth lies somewhere between the picture our greatest critics paint and the ideal to which we aspire. Over the past six years, we've greatly expanded student access to art, music, and physical education. Our data shows that during the 07-08 school year, more than 50 schools lacked art, music, or PE teachers. During the past year, fewer than 20 did not have dedicated teachers, and these schools often use partnerships and other arrangements to provide art services. While we're not satisfied with this improvement, it's important to note that progress has been made, and I'm committed to expanding and improving these opportunities. As I consistently stated through the many school consolidation meetings that we held, I firmly believe that every student should have at least weekly exposure to art, music, and PE instruction. I also believe that we should be providing our students early exposure to foreign language, and that library services can play a key role in helping students explore the world while building their literacy skills. As we discussed yesterday in the Truancy Roundtable, I feel that the real work that DCPS can do to engage students and reduce absenteeism is to offer students new areas to explore and the chance to express themselves. 
We'll continue to expand these opportunities as you will see in our upcoming budget hearing. While we cannot lose focus on the literacy and math skills that are absolutely necessary for our students' future success, we also cannot lose sight of other opportunities that make a school a rich and compelling experience for students. We've made meaningful progress in improving services and will continue these efforts during the upcoming year, but it will take patience, determination, and commitment to build the programs that our students deserve. The second prominent theme we heard related to our comprehensive high schools. I want to be clear that I'm not satisfied with the quality of many of these schools. I believe there are three causes for this problem, and I have confidence that we can provide students improved high school opportunities in the short term while building long-term program improvements. Our high schools have consistently lost enrollment over the past decades. Only two of our high schools have more than 1,000 students. To date, our programming has not kept pace with this change, so the quality of our programs has stagnated. We have an opportunity to create world-class high schools for our students, but to do this, we must use more innovation and more creative solutions to ensure that high school students at each of our schools get access to great programming. Distance learning, flexible scheduling, and specialized offerings at our schools can all play a key role in making sure that our high school students are prepared for jobs of the future. At the same time that our school size has dwindled, an increasing number of students have come to ninth grade unprepared. At many schools, we have more ninth graders than 10th graders because so many students are repeating the grade. Academic failure has bred a culture of truancy at many of these schools, forcing schools to focus narrowly on truancy prevention and remediation rather than on making high school the diverse and exciting experience that it should be. Finally, our high schools have failed to evolve to accommodate new opportunities for students. In many ways, our high schools look exactly the way they did for the last 50 years or more. Students work to accumulate credits during a regular school day and fixed classes at one location. High school just doesn't have to be that way. We can let students explore opportunities at campuses across the city. We can let students find alternative routes to gain the skills that we all feel are critical without logging seat time in classes that may be slow paced or too fast paced for the student. In fact, our work with the State Board of Education and key charter partners on graduation requirements are making this new world a possibility. This would require a bold and imaginative approach to high school that goes far beyond a simple fix in any one school. But I believe this is the only approach that can really give students the education they deserve. Because these changes will take time, we're taking short-term steps to address students' needs today. To do this, we're expanding the number of available seats at some of our most successful high schools. At Banneker High School, where more than half of all juniors and seniors take at least one AP course and all students are on track to graduate on time, I've added 50 new seats. Similarly, similarly through the consolidation with Francis Stevens, School Without Walls will be able to access additional space and expand its student enrollment. We're also working to make sure that we offer meaningful opportunities to students struggling to stay on track. Yesterday, I told you about the Twilight Program at Dunbar, where students who are not on track to graduate are required to attend a special session of classes where they receive individualized attention until they get back on track. We've already seen truancy rates go down at Dunbar as a result of this work, and early indications are the academic achievement is improving as well. Luke C. Moore, our school for disengaged 17 to 20 year old students, also shows great promise in serving students who have not been successful in traditional settings. We plan to supplement these programs with summer sessions to help students catch up to their peers, with summer bridge programs to help middle school students prepare for the rigors and independence of high school, and dedicated programs to help students get back on track to graduation. You'll hear more about this in our upcoming budget hearing. Before I close out my testimony, I want to highlight a few other successes that too often go unnoticed in our schools. As you know, I work tirelessly to improve our schools, and when improvements must be made, I'm a harsh critic. But at the same time, there are many things happening in our schools that are worth bragging about. I want to start by highlighting the work we are doing to ensure that our students are gaining the skills needed to be successful in the future. DCPS, DC actually, was an early adopter of the Common Core State Standards, a set of standards that are rigorous, focused, and clearly articulate the skills all students need for success. 
While other states are implementing these standards incorrect, uh, incrementally, we decided that the best approach was to push ourselves to align all of our assessment and instruction with the standards that, that represent the best practices. The Council for Great City Schools has recognized our work in implementing these standards and our curriculum team has been recognized nationally for this important work. While I always strive to improve our student outcomes on the CAS, I was especially heartened to see that we made gains on the elementary reading portion of the DC CAS, which is aligned to the Common Core, and in fact, this past year was more difficult than previous years. The training and professional development that we've done is paying off in big ways in some schools already. For example, at Thomas Elementary, where we have a strong principal and an instructional team who is committed to improving education for all students, we saw double-digit gains in reading and math in the past year. We've highlighted Thomas as one of our 40 lowest performing schools last year, and they're already more than halfway to their goal of improving their outcomes by 40 points by 2017. The progress that they have made makes me confident that we can reach the ambitious goals that we set. Many of our schools are making innovative investments to improve student outcomes, but I want to highlight Tubman Elementary. Over the past five years, Tubman has gone from 25% proficiency to 65% proficiency, and they continue to seek new ways to improve results. Over the course of that five years, they also merged uh, with minor, which closed. And enrollment continues to go up every single year. Beginning this year, Tubman employed an assistant principal specifically to coordinate and manage efforts to improve student literacy outcomes. The early results we've seen indicate that students continue to improve their skills at decoding words and improving their reading fluency. I'm excited by this model, and we will build on it to address these needs at more schools. There are great things happening in our middle schools as well. At Kelly, Mil at Kelly Miller Middle School in Ward 7, we have a great school leader who's implemented a co-teaching model in which special education teachers partner with subject area teachers to ensure that more students receive the benefit of specialized instruction and more special education students can be successful alongside their peers. You walk into the classroom and you don't know who's in special ed, who's not, who's the primary teacher, who's the co-teacher. We've also implemented a school-wide enrichment model at Kelly Miller. This program, a new take on a traditional gifted and talented program, allows students throughout the school to benefit from challenging and enriching project-based material in areas where they excel rather than focusing only on a select group of students. This program is showing great promise at Kelly Miller. Finally, while I never like to choose favorites, I want to highlight one teacher. Mr. Medley is a Spanish teacher at Whittier. Mr. Medley reminds me of what a huge impact a foreign language teacher can have on his students. His students are filled with joy, wonder, and enthusiasm. He reminds me of why we did the hard work of consolidating schools so that on the other side we can offer more experiences like the one Mr. Medley gives his students every single day. I could go on and on about Mr. Medley, but you don't have to take my word for it. In fact, um, because many people, you actually, Council Member Catania, get out and see what's happening in our schools, but many people don't. And so I want to just share with you a quick visit to Mr. Medley's class on video. Can you start the video? Oh, okay, I'll do the video at the end of my testimony. <laughs> Uh, there's much more I can say about our successes and the investments that we've made and that we'll make in the coming years to build on these successes. Fortunately, we'll have more time for this discussion in the coming months through our budget hearing. But I want to close by telling you how absolutely optimistic I am about the future of DCPS. We've done much of the hard work of building a strong workforce, increasing efficiency in our budget and central office, and in directing tools and money to our classrooms. With the strong foundation that we've laid and the support that we have seen <clears throat> from all of you, we are well on our way to creating a school district where we provide meaningful supports in the schools that need them most, provide great opportunities across the district for all of our students, and dedicate ourselves to building the skills that our students need to be successful. There will always be distractions and those who want to pull us off course, but I believe as we work together, we can focus on those things that serve our students best and are truly effective. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions.
Will we have the video now, or will we have it at? Yeah, we can do the video now. If okay. We can do the video now. Well, we hope to do that. when you wanted to see the video, so I'll get it queued up for you. But if you'd like to start your question. Okay. Well, when you're when you're ready with the video, how about how long is it, Chancellor? Oh, maybe three minutes, two minutes. Perfect. Okay. Uh, Chancellor, we're going to begin a 10-minute round, and I, I want to thank you for uh, your testimony. I want to thank you for your service and your right. Uh, as as members of the committee, we are endeavoring to be in schools two to three times a week minimum, uh, often two to three schools at a time, and we try to spend a couple of hours at each school uh, to, to, to understand from each particular school what their challenges are and what their needs are, uh, how we can serve them, and how we can learn to to help inform um, the work that we do here. And I want to acknowledge that Councilmember Grasso uh, has been uh, steadfast in his uh, participation as a member of this committee in touring with us, uh, and that is uh, uh, very much appreciated. Um, Chancellor, I want to begin with the issue uh, that, that was in my opening remarks. That is, we've set a goal that by 2017 that 70 percent of our students will be proficient in math and in reading. Uh, however, we are at about 45 percent now, and this means that in the next four years, we have to increase these scores by 55 percent. Uh, I'd like you to spend a minute uh, explaining the three strategies uh, that you intend to employ, or the two, uh, I'll leave it up to you, that, what, uh, that you intend to employ to achieve this goal. Yep. So <clears throat> the fundamental strategy that we have to employ to, to achieve the goal is really around, uh, I guess, around literacy and math, right? Um, teaching our children how to read. We actually looked at um, the pace that we've been on and figured even if we double the pace of of change over the last five years, we wouldn't reach the goals that we are looking at. And so um, in trying to think about what we thought were the most strategic levers to pull to get to where we're going, we all agreed that reading is it. If our children are literate, if our children can read at grade level, if each of our kids were coming to us on grade level, then we would actually be able to reach this goal. To do that, we focused all of our teacher professional development on guided reading. Um, this is teaching children how to ensure that they have the phonics and the decoding skills that they need. It's reading fluency and it's reading comprehension. It's ensuring that we have inter reading interventions in place. It's ensuring that our teachers know how to diagnose what's happening with reading in our schools and can um, actually provide differentiated instruction to our young people. Um, we've in fact, with the scope and sequence that we put together that's aligned to the Common Core Standards, kindergarten through 12th grade, we are covering six units over the course of a school year with interim assessments at the end of every piece that actually um, are helping us to understand or providing a much more rigorous approach to um, reading. And so um, these are the standards that nationally will be in place by 2015, and we're actually in ahead of folks um, in terms of trying to reach those standards. We've changed the exam. So the DC CAS actually was aligned to the Common Core Standards last year for the first time. It will be aligned to the Common Core Math Standards for the first year this time. And so we are actually working with our teachers through our professional development program to ensure that they're able to meet those standards. Uh, Chancellor, let me ask about a couple of very uh, simple strategies um, that, that, that you may consider, and I know you are. Uh, in your Proving What's Possible grants, you have some small grants and large grants, and it appears that uh, many of the grants are directed at longer school days, number one, and number two, a focus on literacy. And so um, I appreciate that you're in the process of negotiating your next uh, contract with the Washington Teachers Union. Um, you know, I have a particular point of view that a longer school day, uh, if properly structured uh, with more time on instruction, you know, could be particularly useful uh, as it relates to math and reading. Mm -hmm. uh, can you share with us what the status of your negotiations might be, again, without tipping your hand too much? Is this something that you concur with? Is it something that you that the evidence suggests isn't helpful? Um, and, and regardless, tell us what your strategy is with respect to lengthening the school day. Sure. Um, we actually started, we made extended school day and extended school year an option in approving what's possible grants because we actually agree um, that that is a key strategy to increasing our reading and our math scores. We have 16 schools, if I'm correct, that are currently implementing an extended school day or school year. Um, in our conversations with the Washington Teachers Union, um, we have actually, I guess, I'll say that we are 
um, creating more flexibility within the teachers union contract so that we can actually implement a longer school day and a longer school year. Um, again, anecdotally, I don't want to over rely on our visits, but the visits and Mr. Grasso has his own questions and own impressions from the schools. I concur with what you're saying that you know, we have some extraordinarily talented people running our schools and our teaching uh, staff uh, is exceptional. Um, you know, the, the most recent contract which permitted uh, the teacher evaluation system and the ability to m remove underperforming or minimally effective or ineffective teachers has really transformed the teaching staff of DCPS. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons it's so important for me to go into schools, and I, I believe it's the same is true for my colleagues and they can speak for themselves and why I'm trying to encourage many to join me, is so that we can see for our own eyes the transformation. And we can be informed by this to be partners in leadership is a phrase I use quite a bit because I believe that we are partners in leadership. Um, nearly every school that I attend, uh, when I ask, you know, about a longer school day, not only the principals are asking, and you know, I ask typically how long do you think, and the average is between an hour and an hour and a half, but I'm impressed by how many teachers are willing and eager to do it. And again, that isn't perhaps what we were led to believe of, of, uh, of the membership in years past where the impression was, whether it was real or not, the impression was that we did not have people who were eager to educate or who were there for a particular job and not a mission. And I'm, I'm not stating whether or not that was true or not, but that was the imp impression, the yep. perception. But I'm here to say, as someone who is in schools very frequently, that that is not the teaching staff that we have today. These are individuals who are eager to teach, want to do what's best for the students. And so I'm hopeful that, uh, Chancellor, that uh, we will have a, an extended school day as a part of this new contract that will be a minimum of an hour. Um, you know, and what the point of the teachers was that uh, when this, in these proving what possible, proving what's possible grants, when the principals pull the teachers on whether or not you support a longer school day, it's 90 percent plus of the teachers who are eager to do it. Yeah. So there's no reluctance on the part of our teaching staff. They want to do it. And I think when you look, and we mentioned this example um, before, you know, when we look at Ward 7, the highest performing schools in the ward are, are schools with longer school days. Yeah. KIPP has a longer school day. Beers has a proving what's possible. And the work that they're doing at Plummer is very exciting. Two are traditional public and one is a charter. And they share those things in common. Yeah, uh, so I, I think it isn't a be all end all. There's no silver bullet in, mm -hmm. in perfecting public education, but it's important. Can well, I say while we're two quick on this, things on that? Sure. So one is um, you're absolutely right. And what we find is the addition of one, uh, one extra hour correlates with 26 extra school days through the course of right. the year. Um, so it has a huge impact. And what we're pursuing in the contract is the flexibility so that principals and teachers can decide how they want to do it and not be dictated by a contract that is supposed to be one size fits all. Well, we need greater flexibility in the, you know, and, and I should have mentioned this at the top of my remarks. As I say all the time, I'm not, I believe we have a public education system that has two systems that are, that are, uh, uh, integral and that we, in which we need both to succeed, the traditional public schools and the charter schools. The charter schools have an enviable flexibility on a number of issues as, as far as when they can start and when they can end a school day, mm -hmm. how long the school day is, how long the school year is. And, and we need these, we need, because each of our schools are facing unique and interesting challenges That's and right. have unique and interesting populations they are serving. Mm -hmm. Some have a a uh, majority of, of the parents who are early uh, workers and some are a little later in the day, uh, depending on what type of work you do. There are just an, any number of challenges that if we can have the flexibility for the schools to meet the needs of the community, our issues of retention will be reduced. In, in my remaining time, I want to stay for a second on Ward 7 and 8 schools. Um, and I want to I want to ask about uh, the notion of a we we have application high schools in our traditional public system school system that are very successful. Uh, Phelps uh, is successful. Um, McKinley is successful. School without walls and Banneker and Ellington. These are all successful schools with high attendance, high proficiency, high graduation, high matriculation into college. We don't have a an application only high school in seven and eight. Mm -hmm. Nor do we have an application high school, an application middle school in our system. 
And as I look at, you know, our communities in 7-8, there is a morning diaspora where many families get up and take their children to schools mm -hmm. west of the, the river, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and the, the, we have many, though, who remain in the communities of 7 and 8, and they are burdened by transportation or, or other issues. But our, 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 our very, very best schools are not presently in 7 and 8. We mm -hmm. have good ones, but not excellent ones, not yeah. the ones we expect. Uh, I want to put on the table the idea of an application middle school mm -hmm. for 7 and 8 mm -hmm. and an application high school in 7 and 8 for those kids who don't have the ability to transport themselves to Hardy or to Deal mm -hmm. or to any of the excellent middle schools that exist west of the river. Mm -hmm. um, just as a concept, uh, to have a high performing, because r right now I understand you're building a better system and you didn't create mm -hmm. the system mm -hmm. and you're building a better one and it doesn't mm -hmm. happen overnight. Uh, right now, I worry in this in this midst of social promotion, where we have many underperforming kids who are passed along. They are in schools with children who are ready to learn, but it mm -hmm. serves neither of their interests. Mm -hmm. And what I what I'm looking for is I see very bright lights within mm -hmm. the seven and eight constellation of schools. I see no continuity. Mm -hmm. I see no continuity of a STEM program that can start at a Beers, for instance, mm -hmm. and have a middle school that continues that work and a high school that facilitates that work. Mm -hmm or a language immersion where you can have, you and I benefited greatly from language. We were both graduates of the School of Foreign Service from Georgetown University and we had to pass written and oral language proficiency to get our diploma, yours in mm -hmm. Spanish and mine in German. We understand that these things open doors. Yep. But we don't have a, con a, con a, con a continuity in language immersion from pre-K through high school. Yep. These are the things I think that are going to attract parents, but I really want to think without demanding or mandating, I want you to think about how the communities could create application middle and application high in seven and eight that could compete with the charter schools mm -hmm. and meet the needs of those children who just are not in a position, for whatever reason, to be transported west every morning. This has mm -hmm. to stop. All right? Uh, I'm out of time, and I've, I've exceeded my time for a minute, so I'm going to ask that you give Mr. Grasso 11 minutes and give Mr. Barry 11 minutes. Mr. Grasso. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Did you want to do the video now, or are you good on that? Yeah. Uh, if, if you don't mind, Mr. Grasso, I don't the mind. video I is ready. If, you want, if the video is ready, let's do it. Answer, why don't we go to the video and then sure. I'll turn to Mr. Grasso for 11 minutes and then Mr. Barry for 11 Great. minutes. Great. Let's have the video. Thank you, Mr. Grasso. I appreciate it. Teaching is rewarding because I get to help children learn. I get to help students succeed. I feel that DCPS constantly pushes us to get better as teachers. I walked in the door this morning and thought, wow, this is really a great place to be. This is really a great place to be. My name is Frank Medley, and I'm a Spanish teacher at Whittier Education Campus. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Whittier uses the preschool through eight model. So we have students who are not only in preschool, just starting out, and we also have kids who attend up until eighth grade. So with all of my classes, I try to use a communicative approach where I speak 80 to 90 percent in the target language. 90 percent is the goal. Rojo. Rojo. I taught 12 years uh, before coming to DC Public Schools in the state of Maryland. Amarillo. I could have stayed there forever. It was my family. It was my home. But I needed something, and I was looking for something a little different. I felt like I needed to go to a more urban setting. Otra vez. Let's do it again. So I read something that Michelle Ree said, and she said that it should not matter what zip code that you live in to get a quality education. And I said to myself, wow, wouldn't it be great to be a part of this initiative? I came in as a Frank who had taught Spanish at the high school level. So I had to change. I have five classes a day and I have to create a new Mr. Medley for each class. You know, 8.45, I'm one Mr. Medley. At 10.15, I'm another Mr. Medley. At 12 o'clock, I'm another. It, it, it's hard, but you know, I enjoy it. I enjoy it because it's for the kids. How many people thought short? I think it's very important for us to continue to come in with fresh ideas. The teachers here have an open door policy. I can go in and, and get advice, feedback, um, strategies to use actually in my classroom. 
the student is constantly changing, the teacher has to constantly change as well. Ideally, I would like for my kids to travel abroad, um, to use their Spanish, to meet different people. So I want kids to understand that there's a much bigger world. There's so much more to see. Comprenden? Sí! Sí, excelente, muy bien. Sí. I'm not sure how my students would describe me, but I would hope to hear adjectives like He's kind Fair Inspiring Strict Helpful Fun Role model Numero cinco I came to D.C. to to make a change, to make a difference. And so I took a leap of faith to get here. And I have no regrets. I have no regrets at all. My experience here in D.C. has been wonderful. It exceeded my expectations. It really did. We are D.C. Public Schools. D.C. Public Schools. And we can do this. And we can do this. Thank you. I just wanted to share that because I think far too often people have no idea that we are attracting and retaining great talent, that we have engaging and exciting classrooms, that we have rigorous programs like foreign language and that we have great collaboration and professional development. And I thought if I'm talking about what's good in D.C. public schools, that is the embodim embodiment of it. And I'm working to ensure that every single classroom looks like Mr. Medley's classroom. Let me just say that, uh, Chancellor, I appreciate the video and I, I think though that that video doesn't do the change going on in DCPS justice uh, you know to highlight mr. Medley uh, leaves the impression that he is kind of an exception and he is the rule that I'm seeing mm -hmm. and the quality of teacher uh, that we are attracting to DCPS that now uh, that we now find in nearly every classroom now we always can do better and be better but that is not an exception uh, mr. Medley and teachers like that for those who are viewing are the rule uh, and they are the rule across the schools in the city. Now we have our problems and we can fix them, but it is, you know, the, the work that has been done to attract hot, top talent like Mr. Medley has uh, not gone unnoticed, and we will see these results. Mr. Uh, Grasso. Thank we you have, very much. We have more videos on our website. Uh, how many do you have? Uh, 15 or 20 That's of them. That's great. I think keep promoting. That's the we idea. We will. Thank you. Good morning, Chancellor. Good uh, morning. In 2007, Michelle Reese swept into town and shook the D.C. public school system to its core. The results of her effort will long be debated. Many neighborhoods have reaped results, while others have continued to see decline and destabilization. Most of those who have not reaped results are in wards 5, 7, and 8, which generally have the worst performing schools and have faced repeated school closures. The one thing I can say without a doubt that I appreciated about Michelle Reese was that she had a clear five-year plan. That plan expired in 2012. While even the best laid plans go awry, a plan is something that can be measured, that can be adjusted, and then can be succeed. I came to watch one of your early testimonies in front of the Committee of the Whole back in late 2011. I knew the five-year plan for education was going to expire soon. I was eager to see the next five-year plan laid out in broad terms with sweeping goals and a clear path forward for schools. I walked away from that hearing tremendously disappointed, not just that DCPS did not appear to be rolling out a grand new plan, but also that the council at the time failed to even ask the question. I've read your current five-page strategic plan, and I think it lacks all the necessary elements of a guiding document. I don't blame you. I think DCPS, the Charter School Board, OSSI, the Deputy Mayor, the council, the school board, and the mayor all must work together to figure out where we are going there's no greater effort in our city than turning our educa education system completely around. So we come to the current DCPS crisis, the school closures, a drastic action that doesn't appear to fit in any plan. It seems like a shoot first, ask questions later approach. The effort won't likely save money. It will hurt primarily poor African American neighborhoods in wards 5, 7, and 8, causing dislocation and disruption. The school consolidation transition plan you pass along this week is too late. The school year ends in less than four months, and the parents have already been shopping around for new schools to make out boundary to make out of boundary lottery deadline, which ended last Monday. This plan should have been rolled out at the same time you announced the closures. The details of the plan are still lacking. I was unable to discern who will actually lead this effort. 
Our next crisis is going to the boundary and feeder changes. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's a plan for that. In fact, the transition plan should be in our five-year transition plan. We need to transition to high-performing schools in every ward. I implore you, Chancellor Henderson, to lead in this effort, to engage with the mayor, to engage in every resource that you have available so that our city can create a strategy that can be carried out and we can get the buy-in that's necessary from the community. This effort needs vision and it needs leadership. What I want to know as I go through my questions today is what your plan is. And it may be that you have one, and I think you do, um, but it's just not published. And so what I'm going to do, every kind of, kind of angle that I'm going on with my questions is to try to dig deeper into what that plan is, uh -huh. to where we're going with it, and to how we can get it out. I was tremendously disappointed yesterday at the truancy oversight hearing um, uh, at the fact that there didn't seem to be a plan there either. Even though there's been a truancy task force in place for two years, um, the you know forms that we had in front of us weren't filled out. The the approach seemed to be haphazard. You you weren't totally buying into some of the kind of plans. It seemed like the council imposed at the time. I mean this this whole thing frustrates me because uh, it's too important not to succeed. Mm -hmm. I will echo. Uh, what the chairman said, I've been visiting the schools and I see successes. I see a lot of successes. And, but I see them in a scattered um, way. I don't see a coordinated effort uh, to make these successes grow, to move them to other parts of our city than where they are. Um, and you know, maybe we just haven't gotten there yet. I'm willing to, to give that latitude. I think that there is time still to do this. And I have a great optimism that we can continue to do this. We cannot do it in a um, siloed approach. It has to be a coordinated effort among across all the agencies, I think as Chairman Catania has stated numerous times, um, and between the two systems that we have in place. I understand your problem with, um, or your, it's not really, I think you have a challenge in, in, in the, with the charter system. It's not something that, um, that is easy to deal with. There's not the same oversight. There's not the same standards. Um, uh, and that makes it hard. I think it's our job in the government to push for similar consistent standards and reporting. Um, the one question I have and I want to start with today is um, can you talk a little bit about how you leverage best practices? Um, how do you leverage best practices between uh, just among the traditional school system and the you know elementary, middle? We, we went and visited Ann Beers um, which was just wonderful. It was a great experience to tour and to see. Um, how do you take that to other places? And then how do you go and research what's happening in the charter system? Mm -hmm. uh, and what's your plan to do this going forward? Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> I guess quickly, we actually, one of the promises of the charter sector was that in addition to providing competition, there would be opportunities for collaboration and the sharing of best practices. I don't think over the 15 years that we've been doing this that there has been a ton, but I can tell you that over the last few years we have been intentional about um, working with charters, learning best practices. So there are a number of, I think, examples. One, um, the extended, extended day work that we are doing, we looked at our charter partners, we sat down with KIPP, and understood what they do on their extended school day. We've talked with Thurgood Marshall about what they do with their summer bridge program so that as we create these programs, we're actually learning from people who are doing them well. We do, in fact, I came from a celebration two nights ago um, with E.L. Haynes, which started the Common Core Collaborative um, for teachers across the city in partnership with DCPS and other charters to tackle this idea of, um, of being ready for the current Common Core standards. Can you give me a, a, a concrete example in a school, um, about the elementary, middle, and high school, where you've taken an idea that's in another school, and it could be traditional or charter, and implemented it in a different school where it needed to have some kind of infusion of change and you know uh, progress in that way. Well, I mean, I feel like every day we, I mean, our schools are coordinated in clusters so that things that are happening in good places, um, we get to extend that. For example, Tubman Elementary School, which I cited earlier, hired an assistant principal for literacy, right? Mm -hmm. That is dramatically changing their literacy outcomes, and we will put those assistant principals for literacy in where, 10 other where schools. Where did you learn that? Where did you get that idea 
to bring it and put it at Tubman like the that. The leader at Tubman and the leadership team at mm -hmm. Tubman mm -hmm. recognized that they had a literacy problem, that it wasn't just about reading no, intervention. No, I understand and that. No, and that I think they, people can create their um, their needs, and I think that's that, that's not where I'm going. Though. I and I believe they do that. Well, we've I'm, seen we've seen it in other in other places. So we a group cluster three, Amanda Alexander's cluster, just went out to Montgomery County to Garfield Elementary School, mm -hmm. which is a high performing, low poverty school. The principals got to meet with the other principals with the principal at Garfield. They got to great. see how they do staff meetings. Is that the kind of thing that you're talking about? Yeah, and, we um, do that and then all the time. Great. And so then at I just, the high school level. Well, well hold on. I just I just want to I want an exact example of you know, the literacy program is an example of something that's new there. But I, I'm talking about an example of a program idea or a change in the in the way you approach the, whatever it is. S give me something that's concrete uh, that you took from one place and put in another place to make it work? Um, School-wide enrichment model. So okay. many high-performing schools actually, in order to deal with their gifted and talented students, they, apps, they uh, implement the Renzulli school-wide enrichment model. Okay. We looked at school districts all over the country, saw that as a best practice. We actually started it, intended to start it in only two schools, Hardy and Kelly Miller. West also picked it up with their Proving What's Possible money. Mm -hmm. And so we have the SEM program in three schools across the district. We'll likely expand that, um, probably double it in the next budget round. So um, that's great. So that's one example. So who... And I'm sure there's more, um, and I don't need to put you on the spot to keep doing more and more, but who in your office handles this kind of uh, work on collaboration, on benchmarking, on taking what works? I mean, this is really, I think, the way you're going to spread your success from Ann Beers or from somewhere else to another part of our city is the direct, intentional implementation of taking what works and putting it there. Sure. I mean, who literally everybody across our staff. So for teacher evaluation, we went out and looked at all of the teacher evaluation systems in the country and in fact we created one that was we took the best from the different evaluation mm -hmm. systems and put together an evaluation system that right now is leading the nation so it's our instructional superintendents Barbara Adderley for example who saw um, a, an innovation called innovations in learning which actually uses technology to teach reading she saw it on a Today Show she contacted the the leader of it in Chicago and we started two years ago just in her cluster um, and now it's in a number of our elementary right. schools. So everybody across the organization mm -hmm. has to look for best practices. So then is there like a team or somebody that gets together to talk about this? Or is it just kind of like a light bulb goes off and you say, oh, I saw it on the Today Show, let's try it? Or how is this done in a so what happens? way? Yeah, so what happens is when people have proposals to do things in a different way or to bring a new practice, mm -hmm. they bring it to their team. It might happen at the team level. So the instructional superintendents talked about the innovations for learning treatment and decided to pilot it in Barbara's cluster. And they actually had the resources within their team to do it. When we started to see success, brought that to the management team and said, this is what we want want to do across the board. So we actually have a decision making process up and down the organization that allows us to test these things out. And then you track it back. So then you so then basically you do it for a year and you see, oh gosh, it actually doesn't work in that neighborhood or in that school and then you stop it and try something else or well, if, kind of like you know you give it I'm getting at yes. I'm trying to figure out how you are yeah. So we have a form. data and accountability team, and their job is to look at program evaluation to provide us with um, information that tells us whether or not the things that we are doing are working. Okay. Well, um, thank you. I'll continue on this as I go. Sure forward. enough. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Grasso. Uh, we've been joined by uh, Councilmember uh, Marion Berry, who's a member of the committee, and I'd like to turn to uh, Mr. Berry for his round of questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank you for your outstanding leadership and guided this committee. Uh, my opinion uh, early on was to keep the education in the community as a whole. But I realize now that that was not the way we ought to go. We need a ded dedicated uh, group of council members who are focused singly, singly on education. Uh, at some point, maybe, uh, we'll reorganize and put UDC and, and the community college in this committee because they all go together. Our whole attitude ought to be uh, from the cradle uh, to the grave of educating our, our people. Let me say welcome to Chancellor and, and Ms. Shepard. And uh, we were together yesterday for quite a bit of time. 
The only thing I'm going to ask you to do, uh, Madam Chancellor, is make your answer shorter. Okay. And uh, let uh, me finish my question. Okay. And et cetera. Uh, let me just say this. Washington, D.C. school system is not unlike the other urban school systems, facing with the same set of problems, a truancy, graduation rates, violence, public safety, uh, dropout rates, uh, motivating students to want to come to school, making schools inviting for students to come. So I don't want people to think that we're just out here by ourselves with all these problems and et cetera. Uh, the whole nation, in fact, internationally, in terms of education, I think the uh, United States lagged something like 17 or 18 behind Asia and some other, other places. So this country needs to refocus ourselves on what we do to close the achievement gaps. What do we do about making our students uh, prepared to learn? And I'm going to talk a little bit about this. We all know, we talk about it, but we don't know anything about it, that poverty is a driver, a driver of what happens in our schools, what happens in the workplace, what happens in any place else. Poverty is a driver that uh, makes it almost impossible for a student from the in elementary schools, pre-K school, to come to school as prepared to learn as a middle-income parent. Because most of these uh, students, uh, there are 32,000 students in our public schools, and two-thirds of all of our students are from low-income families. So they present special challenges, generations of dependency, generations of not going to school, generations of not uh, uh, attending PT meetings, generations of being involved, and et cetera. And so we realize now, uh, as we should have done before, how extensive poverty has on our system. Mm -hmm. And Madam Chancellor, I asked you about that uh, last time you gave me a little, well, I thought was kind of a flippant answer. You didn't mean it that way, though. I think you, reducing poverty is all of our business. And this government has done very little to reduce poverty. Our own city, our own government, don't hire the majority of our people from the District of Columbia. The majority of people who work in our uh, district government, 55 percent, are from non-D.C. residents, which means that we are depriving this city of major income that could be used uh, for education. But we have to get serious about reducing poverty. It's not going to be done overnight. It didn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. But poverty is such a driver. I see it. I see it in the criminal justice system. We see it in everything that we see it in special needs. We see it all over the place. And so that's the foundation that I come from. Also, in terms of our, uh, my ward, uh, I represent a ward which has 20 uh, traditional public schools, two high schools, three middle schools, and 20 elementary schools, and 14 charter schools. And I represent a ward that has the highest unemployment in the city, a ward that has the highest number of children in the city that's in poverty. I represent a ward which has a large share of the 31,000 students who are Tanif children and 18,000 families. I'm trying to set the tone here. Huh? You know that we cannot do business as usual. We've got to change the paradigm shift. Let me talk a little bit about Michelle Reed, since Mr. Russo, Russo raised it. He's all good, all our happy about it and glowing terms and so on. Let me just say this. My staff did a major study on the achievement scores, on the proficiency in math in low-income communities. And in math and low-income community, Michelle Reed was a disaster. It was a paper, a paper um, image of, of her. If she was so doggone good, and I would take stuff enough, but I'd be nice today. If she's so good, why are we now facing these low test scores? Why are we now having a school like Stanton Elementary, which had a 12% uh, reading proficiency, where we had Kramer uh, at 16, 17%, and Akasha, and now 
12 percent. And so my idea of goodness is the proof is in the pudding and in the eating. May I say already, I, I got numbers to back it up, what's well, a total disaster in terms of low-income communities. Put a lot of emphasis on middle-income people, a lot of emphasis on true rest of the park. But that's not where the problems are. People who live west of the park or who go to school west of the park, they have the support systems that they can uh, give people. So, Madam Chancellor, uh, I want us to focus as a city on poverty. Now, in terms of the school system, you have one of the toughest jobs, I think, in America. And you're up to it, too. And I commend you for your tenacity, for your courage, for your uh, strength. But we have to move faster than we are. So I want to know a lot about these 40 schools and 40 points uh, in five years. Uh, I don't want a total picture right now, but I want a comprehensive review of it later on in writing so we can see exactly where we are. And also I want to know what's going to be the consequences of, of, of you and other people if you don't make that goal. Uh, I think it's a, a, a doable goal. I think it's a high set goal, et cetera. And so we, we talked about truancy yesterday. We, you know, my attitude about that is in the wrong place. You're not responsible. You shouldn't be held responsible for leading the effort on reducing truancy. The deputy mayor of education should not be because that's not where the cohesion can come from. You cannot tell the head of mental health and Barron and other people what to do. You can suggest what they do. Only the city administrator can do that. We talked about that yesterday, so we'll uh, spend some more time on it. The other area I want to get into with you, uh, I've talked to you about it, is athletics. It's a shame what we do in terms of athletics. I think we spent about four or five million dollars on athletics. And I've asked you to put together a plan where we can move as early as September on changing the focus of our uh, athletic system. In some instances, in low-income communities, it's athletics that draws them to the school. It's athletics that draws them to the school. The ability to play football and basketball and track and et cetera. So that when I finish making my statement, I'm going to ask you to spend some time on what you intend to do about making our system academically excellent and our athletics af athletically excellent because not only is it an opportunity to go to college in terms of scholarships, et cetera, but when we make that decision to do that, it's also make another decision. We have to give these athletes some academic support so they can make the GPA, they can mm -hmm. meet the standards of the NCAA and other places that you go to. And so uh, with that being the case, let me just start with you on it, it, uh, athletics. What are your plans? What are your thoughts? And this is not a gender discussion either. There are some people who say women can't think about athletics the way men can. I don't buy that. I think women can think about it. There was a time in this country when women couldn't participate in athletics mm -hmm. at the local school level. So I got about a, a minute and 30 seconds. So take that minute and 30 seconds and tell me what you're going to do <laughs> about athletics. And be short. Be succinct. Okay. Um, one, we have actually expanded the number of sports that we're offering under our new athletic director. But we still have to do more. Just like we've improved the quality of our teaching, we have to improve the quality of our coaches and our athletic leaders. And part of the problem is right now we're not paying them enough, um, and so it has an impact on our ability to attract talent. That's one of the things under discussion in our Washington Teachers Union contract. We also have to go out and make sure that we're raising money. So my team had a conversation just the day before yesterday with the Doug Williams Foundation, and they are actually going to contribute money to help us support our athletics um, team so that they have state-of-the-art equipment. We just have to continue to focus on expanding and improving Madam Chair, athletics. Madam, just Madam like Chancellor, my time is running. Okay. Let me enter into the record some things. Approved budget for athletics in 13 was $3,268,000. Revised budget was three million six hundred and seventy five thousand dollars. Actual expenditure was three thousand eleven. Three million five eight six 
that is awful. That's awful in terms of out of this 800 million, what's the, what's the size of your budget? Yes. What's the size of your budget? 800 million. Not 800 million dollars, you get almost $4 billion for athletics. That got to change, Madam Chancellor. So get ready for me and the members of this committee to really push hard on you not uh, going to Doug Williams and such, but go to the D.C. government. Spend more money. I want at least $20 million spent in 14 on this subject. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If you are able to give me $20 million in 14, I'll spend it. Uh, I'm not, you're going to send us a budget. I will spend it on athletics. Uh, thank you, Mr. Barrett. We'll have, uh, we'll have additional rounds. Uh, I, I want to start with some opening uh, statements that I should have uh, began the hearing with, and that is for individuals who are interested in seeing that the, the submission uh, of responses to the committee's questions, they are available online uh, at dccouncil.us. You can also find them uh, in hard copy in the committee's office. Um, we, we, I have organized this committee as, the same as I organized the health committee where we attempt to get uh, pretty thorough invasive questions to the agencies, uh, you know, weeks in advance of the hearings and have a chance for a response and then we have sit downs with the agencies on the staff level to have further clarification and, and the follow up responses are also online and also available. And so what I very much want our time with the Chancellor to be is about focusing on, obviously each member is entitled to, to raise any question they want on any degree of specificity. Uh, I, I intend to use this for broader themes so that we can give the general public a broader impression of where we're going, not again to diminish the importance of specific questions, but individuals who want the follow-up specifics that the, that, the, that the agency has provided us can either go online or go to our website. Uh, I find getting a lot of those uh, items out of the way and available, asked and answered, permits us to focus on informed, broader themes, and so that's where I'm uh, focusing on today. With respect to, uh, you know, the, the, the state of public education, and why don't you, if you don't mind, you can begin my round. You know, in the district, it's just time for us to evolve into the appreciation that nearly half of our children are in charter schools and that, that half are in traditional public schools, and they both make up the public education system. And I say this a lot because we have uh, extremists on both sides. We have people in the public education world who think that charter schools, uh, you know, are, um, that they, there's no good thing to say about them, and then we have people in the charter school movement who have nothing good to say about traditional public schools. Now, thankfully, these individuals in both camps are the minority, and the great majority of people uh, you know, want to see both systems work. And so what I'm trying to do is provide a space where both, where we can, you know, talk without taboo actually about, you know, the things that are wrong with both systems, but that we somehow disarm from this uh, inter-system squabble and we start focusing on what isn't working in both systems as opposed to a market share fight of one over the other. I think that, you know, after five, uh, six years of school reform, you know, it's time for us to take an honest look at our infrastructure about who, which parts of our government are serving which purposes. And, and I, I hope that we can begin uh, with members of the committee informed by the public and of course the charter schools and uh, the traditional public schools, OSSI, our Office of State Superintendent, our Deputy Mayor and others, to have a conversation about what works for parents and what works for students. That's what's important. Mm -hmm. And so I look at, and uh, one of my colleagues raises a good point about where do you go for best practices? Mm -hmm. Well, right now I think that that, that that is something that is needed in our public education system generally, a repository of, of data-driven, evidence-backed best practices. Uh, is that DCPS alone? Where is it within each of the LEAs, each of the separate charter schools? Mm -hmm. And where might that information best be housed? And I suggest and submit that perhaps our Office of the State Superintendent can serve as a repository, that there can be a data and research division there that looks for best practices and shares them not only with DCPS, but also each of the other uh, local education agencies or charter schools so that we can learn from each other. And frankly, there are things that the charter schools can learn from traditional public schools and things that the public schools can learn from, from there. So that's one issue. I think that's helpful for schools. I think for parents right now, they're fighting to try to find 
uh, understand this evolving system. And, and I've, I've been critical of an absence of leadership atop the public education system. The chancellor is responsible for public schools, but who is responsible for the charter schools? And who's responsible for coordinating the two and establishing minimum standards, uh, expectations for public money that don't infringe on the integrity and autonomy of any system? And so baseline assessment standards about how do we assess, how do we judge what school, whether it's a charter or a traditional, as being good or not, what are our testing integrity standards, what are our minimum floor expectations. And that doesn't exist. I submit the state office, uh, the office of the state superintendent would be a good place to have those uh, objective standards, uh, you know, developed and implemented and applied equally across the system. I think our parents uh, are left without good information. Uh, and this is not a, a criticism of the chancellor. Uh, it's a criticism of above the pay grade of the chancellor. You know, we have a we have a, a, an executive in the city that is responsible for all public education, chartered and traditional. And yet, if I'm a parent, I don't know where to go to get the best option for my child in my neighborhood. And so, you know, one of my colleagues raises the very legitimate issue about what do I do if, if, for instance, I'm at Kenilworth, if I'm at Davis, and these are two schools in Ward 7 and they're changing. And I see the options, and you've promised transportation, especially as it relates to Kenilworth, because it will be a challenge to get kids to Houston. It will be a challenge to get kids to Thomas. And so we, we need this transportation. But if I'm a parent, I don't know where to go to mm -hmm. get this information. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't have someone who can push other folks to get it to me. And so we have an ombudsman that first was in the mayor's office, and then, then it went into a bit of a witness protection program. And then it came back and is now assigned to the State Board of Education, I guess. But, but what is the role of the ombudsman? Right now it appears to be focused exclusively on DCPS, and I think that's too narrow. I think the ombudsman needs to be focused on all public schools in the city. And so it would, I, in my mind, we would have a dashboard that would be run by the, the ombudsman that would allow parents to know across the board and in their community what this, what what the standards are of our schools, what the test scores are, retention, class sizes, uh, you know, whether there's spaces available, you know, because we hear all the time, well, there's no room at this school, or that there's room at this school. Um, you know, and if there are challenges in the application process or the lottery process, or if the child is in the school and is confronting problems, whether it be unfair disciplinary action or whatever. There is a role for an independent ombudsman not associated with the CPS or the charter schools to help our parents understand their options and, and, and assist them in navigating those options. So, look, I, I think we're overdue for this conversation. Now, I, I have a different point of view than some of my colleagues uh, with respect to the legacy of the prior leadership of Ms. Ree. Uh, the impact uh, teacher evaluation system and the changes that that uh, brought about has given us the Mr. Medleys. Mm -hmm. It has cleared out a lot of dead wood of teachers who were not in it for the right reasons, who long ago ran out of gas and who weren't performing. And there is no reason to apologize for that. In fact, you know, we are a national leader in teacher evaluations. What we did in this school system with impact is nationally transformative. Mm -hmm. now, we live with it every day, so we get accustomed to it. We think it's not a big deal. But, but making sure that kids have competent teachers, while may appear common sense, the prior agreement did not make that so. It gave you, once you had tenure, you were there for life, and it took an act of Congress to remove you, and we assigned one child after another to an underperforming teacher in a criminal way, and that is no longer the way it is. So don't count me among those who are, gonna, who are going to uh, quarrel with that, mm -hmm. to the contrary. But, you know, but, but to another colleague's point, uh, Madam Chancellor, we, we've seen what is possible and we want to go faster. Yes. And I, I, and I, I think, uh, again, I want us to kind of disarm from, you know, the finger pointing and let us all put our shoulder to the wheel to fix this. So that was a long statement, but I think it's important for people to know the mindset, at least, that, that I'm taking to this situation as the chairman. I want to, in my remaining minutes, talk about testing. Um, we test uh, third through eighth and then tenth grade um, our DC CAS, but we don't test 11th and 12th graders. And I think that is a mistake because I don't believe we have any meaningful way to judge whether or not a high school senior has the skill sets that should be expected from a graduate. Mm -hmm. And we kid people into thinking, and it's mostly you know, kids who, who aren't disciplinary problems who show up can graduate, mm -hmm. regardless of whether or not they master skill sets, right? Even though we have a huge retention rate. Those are kids who just don't show up and we have no choice but to fail them. 
Uh, Chancellor, I want to move in the direction across the board from traditional and non-traditional uh, public schools where a 12th grade exam where there are minimum expectations, where people know that they are, that there is an exam that they must pass to graduate. It is done in other states, uh, coincidentally other states who have much better outcomes sure. than we do, uh, where, where as a condition to graduate, you must master these skills. We are no longer going to lie to kids and say, by virtue of a beating heart and showing up, that you have done a good job. Yeah. Now, it, it isn't intended to fail kids. It's no. intended to, then we have to build the system back words to make sure that every child is on grade level and every child we've done our level best to get them to that pass rate. I think it's a part of raising expectations across the board and I'd like your opinion as to whether or not that's something you're willing to entertain and whether or not you have immediate reactions positively or negatively to that. Yep, I, I actually support that idea. Um, Although when you look at the other states, like Virginia, which has the standards of learning, we set that at a statewide level. The state says this is what every 12th grader or every 11th grader will achieve. And so um, at DCPS, in fact, over the course of the last few years, we've been um, intentional about trying to expand our coverage of tested grades and subject areas so that we can have that benchmark and that expectation. Um, we just aren't financed to be able to do end of course exams. That's something that actually sits at the OSI, but I support the... Well, then we're going to have to, again, and, and I have an extremely capable staff member who's focused on budgets, and by the way, no offense to anyone at the table, but the DC uh, PS budgets are an enigma. Uh, trying to sort this out, some get spent, some doesn't. You need to crosswalk it. I mean, again, it's not assigning blame to yeah. the table. It's a legacy issue of a, almost of incompatibility between previous CFOs and the chancellors and superintendents yes. that have contributed to this, uh, this nightmare that we will spend the next few years sorting out. Uh, I think if we are going to, uh, Madam Chairman, if we are going to, uh, Chancellor, we are going to start uh, demanding more of our students and our teachers and ending the, the social promotion. We have to re-examine our report cards. Now I've reviewed our report cards and I don't understand them. Mm -hmm. And I don't, un I don't know if I'm a parent who is not a, you know, an educational expert if I understand them. And so if we're going to start saying, look, in order for your child to progress, and especially now that we're going to have three of these assessments through the year, we'll be able to know we should be able to know where the child is. Yeah. And based on testing three times a year instead of one, we ought to be able to have conversations with parents about this is where your child is and this is what we need to do collectively to make sure your child is on grade level. Uh -huh. And if your child isn't, then a summer school is required and a meaningful summer school and you must pass it or you don't go forward. Yeah. That has to happen, right? Yes. But we have to we have to we have to integrate the new CAS testing yes. with an understandable re performance report. Agreed. Because I look at it, and if I'm a parent, nowhere do I see the areas where I have to work with my child to improve. Yep. I just think, well, things are fine. So I agree with you. Um, two quick things. One, we've done, I think we've made nice changes at the early childhood level where you actually can see what your um, child is doing well and what your child is not doing well and what you actually can do. It comes with the report. Um, you get an M-class report with your report card. I've seen it. I don't understand it. Okay. And I've got to um, be honest with you. I think... Uh, perhaps maybe someone could explain it to me, but but I need simpler. Okay. I'm just saying, as a parent, yep. I'm busy. You know, right? I need to be able. I need it to be clear cut. My child is on track or isn't on track, and there are just page after page of one through fours and. You know, as a, and I just so the M class report is actually a bar which is red, yellow, and green, and there's a little person on it, and it tells you whether your kid is in the red, yellow, or green zone, and it tells what specific um, issues that your kid right. has, and then it tells you what you could do at home to support. Well, I, I'm over my time, so I'll come yep. back to this. I don't mean to cut you off. I'll come back to this. Okay. I'm going to add an additional minute and a half to my colleagues' time. Um, but I, I, also, I think all of these things are important conversations to have. Uh, it isn't an effort to tell you how to do it. Yep. But if we don't understand it, chances are our parents don't understand it. And we just have to all be aligned on what the objective is. Child, the children on grade level, mastering before they move on. And at the end of this journey, they have a diploma that, that, that people understand equates to skill sets, mm -hmm. that they have a chance to then go on to college and succeed. Mm -hmm. Moving kids through with a kind of a smiley face but not really mastering at 12th and they go to college and then it's often failure yeah. because they're just not ready for the next step. Yeah. And this doesn't happen overnight, Chancellor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Uh, please add a minute and a half to Mr. Grasso's time and a minute and a half to Mr. Barry's. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Chairman. Um, you know, I, I, you made a statement in your comments that I think is part of my theme is, you know, the how do we get things to be applied equally across the system, you know, mm -hmm. in every LEA, in every school. Mm -hmm. um, that's the challenge I think we have here. And, you know, I, I want to go back to the Office of Data and Accountability question I, you, you mentioned. Um, I just want to understand a little bit more what its role is and what it does. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, first, let's just, do, you, do you think that data collection is one of the core issues for DCPS and, and besides just testing but also in programs? Yes. So, in fact, when we got here in 2007, we realized we didn't have information to be able to make good decisions. And being a data-informed decision-making body, we actually had to build systems. We had 29 data systems that didn't talk to each other. Where we are today is we actually have lots of programmatic information that helps us understand where we are. We've also made it pretty transparent. Um, so school leaders have Spidey, which is a dashboard, which allows them to see how their students are progressing amongst a number of different things. We also have put with our school scorecards um, information online about what is happening at each school so that parents have the opportunity to see that. And um, so you, so DCPS is responsible for publishing these, uh, this data results? Um, we don't publish everything we have. We have reams and reams of data, but right. we try to publish as much as we possibly can so that people have an understanding of what's going on. And um, this is a little trickier. How does that effort coincide with other agencies. So, you know, you take this and, it, you know, this kind of metric, whatever it is that you've measured, uh, and then you see that it might have an impact on another agency. How do you uh, communicate that and how do you uh, kind of engage the rest of the government in your effort? Can you I don't know. Give me For an example, example? Um, you're measuring, well, I mean, I think showing up to school is one thing you measure uh -huh. and and so the child does or doesn't show up to school you you have to then engage other parts of the community mm -hmm. um, whether it be the Department of Mental Services or you know so you know anybody yep. how, how do you Got it. So, yeah. so, yep, so we actually, both through the Deputy Mayor for Education's office and honestly through all of our cabinet colleagues, um, I'm able to pick up the phone and say to Adrian Todman, um, we are, we're having an issue around housing. Um, or I can pick up the phone and call right. Deputy Mayor Otero and say, can you realign your social services around my 40 lowest performing schools? Because it doesn't matter what I do academically if we're not taking care of the social supports. Um, then we won't reach it. And a deputy mayor for education actually serves as a conduit between us and okay. and our um, our sister so, agencies. So, uh, so, so I guess I would ask you then, just as the chancellor, do you support more openness in this data, like getting it out there to the public? I know um, ossie has been working on that some with mm -hmm. some of their data, but what about for you? Do you see any yeah. downfall in that? No, not at all. I mean, I think we're only limited by our capacity, right? And so mm -hmm. at the same time that I get the pressure to shrink my central office budget, I get demands for more data, more communication, more whatever. And so we just, you know, we, we don't have a problem with putting it out. We just don't have the capacity to do, I think, everything right. that everybody wants. Um, I I think that there's still an interim chief in that office. Is that true? And can you tell me uh, the timing on getting someone permanent in there? For me, it's a yep. it's extremely important sure. that we get this information to the public to to get out there going to exactly to what the chairman was saying about making informed choices. Yeah, um, I think one of the things that we've recognized is this is an incredibly difficult uh, position to hire. But I'm pleased because we actually just hired a, uh, just uh, saw a candidate that I think we will be making an offer to. Okay. So I so expect a week, I, two um, weeks. I, I expect in the next 15 to 20 days we'll make an offer. Make an offer. Uh -huh. okay. Have you made offers before and they haven't been taken? No. How long has it been vacant? Uh, Kate left in December, um, November, November, November so since that's November. Not too long. Um, you know, I, I think this goes to the core of how we're going to succeed. I was mm -hmm. talking about this this morning with the business community that. You know, the more data that we can get out there to folks to understand their choices when it comes to choosing the, the right mm -hmm. school is to the advantage of both systems, really, the, the charter and the traditional, to get that information out yep. there. Um, 
and in every facet. So I, I just I think the more robust and deeper we can go with this, the better we'll be. Have you um, seen our school scorecards? I have. Okay. Yeah, and I, I mean I think they're a good start. Yeah. So I mean, in addition to just testing information, there's school climate information, there's attendance information, parent satisfaction information, there's all kinds of information. I think one of the things that is a is uh, that we've been in discussions with the public charter school board about is whether or not we could actually sync the tiering system and our school scorecards so that parents are looking at one set of information. Um, right. We also have been in conversations about whether or not we could get to a common lottery so that parents are just applying one time and one place and then can choose all of these kinds of things. So we've been in conversations and I think we're moving in that direction. You think? Do you think those conversations are, you say they're moving, but you know, I would consider that uh, from a standpoint of you know importance very high to get this information in the hands of these parents so when we when when we actually started with our scorecard project um, the public charter school board was starting with their t uh, PMF project and we actually tried to figure out if we could get all of the information to be congruent their need for PMF as an accountability tool and our use of scorecards as an informational tool meant that we couldn't actually put all of the information together but we actually laid out a path that within three years we'd be able to um, put something together I think with this educational plan that we're working on with the mayor's office I think that'll be one of the things that come out it, it'll when was that? To get to. Um, when that was, was that? that was a year ago, I guess. So within because this more is years. the second year at a PMF. Okay. So yeah, I think in the next two years we could get to kind of more universality around information sharing. So and when you're looking at the information, um, I think there's several levels. It's one having it open, and you know, open data is very important, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, parents can make the best choice. There's analyzing the programs to make sure best practices. Mm -hmm. um, are not only implemented but effective. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's this other question I wonder that you, if you look at, um, what about the impact of various um, kind of demographic or uh, other issues on the programs themselves? Mm -hmm. So do you look at um, any kind of achievement issues against poverty indicators? Mm -hmm. um, and if you do, what are you seeing? So oftentimes when we start a new program or when we try something new, we actually look at it, um, we'll try it in a low performing school and then the high performing school to try to understand what the differences are. Can you around. use an example of a program? Um, so the school wide enrichment model which um, we pegged to happen at Hardy Middle School which is over in Northwest and at Kelly Miller Middle School. Um, same program and in fact we're seeing different levels of implementation. Um, the, the best implementation that we have going right now is at Kelly, Middle, Kelly Miller Middle School. And I think the project based aspect of the SEM program um, is something that is that deals with student engagement at a very different level in a low uh, in a high poverty neighborhood than necessarily in a, a school where in fact there are lots of other things to engage students. And so we're seeing tremendous results or I think more tremendous results at Kelly Miller right now. And I think Hardy will actually um, uh, catch up, but the ability for kids to do Rube Goldberg models, like to do hands-on science activities, you know, in middle school, where middle school is usually just drill and kill, I think is having a very different effect at Kelly Miller than it is at Hardy. Yeah, I mean, again, that, that that's interesting to me because um, it's kind of a, you're in a weird catch-22 because um, I would like to see, you know, this equal, you know, applied equally across the entire mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, structure and you know, yes. everything, but but at the same time, every school is going to be different, and yep. every community and neighborhood has different needs, so you have to be nimble at the same time, and I think it's a challenge. You know, we were talking about kind of accountability earlier between, you know, for benchmarking. The, you know, the principal might in one school say, oh, I heard this idea, and try it a little bit, and then give it to your cluster, and then it gets to central administration, you know, and back and forth, and I think there has to be nimbleness in that effort. Mm -hmm. um, I, the reason I always push on the idea of a plan, though, is because I think that we have to commit to principles, at least, you know, mm -hmm. that are that are at the high level um, that everybody buys into, mm -hmm. and I think that's where testing and data play a huge role mm -hmm. because you can say that's not even meeting one of our, 
you know, principles. That's not being mm -hmm. one of our goals. Yeah. So I, I mean, I, if, if we have not, if we need to communicate a plan differently, I'm happy to do that. But I, I want to challenge this idea that there is not a plan. First of all, every year we lay out a performance plan. It's clear. It's public. It's on our website. It's on the, um, the DC.gov website, which shows what we're going to accomplish that is pegged towards the five, the goals in our five-year plan. And you can look at our 12 not just our what the goals were, but whether we met those, the 13 pieces published as well. But broadly, right, the, the plan is, I, I think, fairly simple. Um, we've been dogged about the quality of people in our schools and will continue to be that way because that's the most significant in-school factor in moving student achievement. We've also been dogged now about the rigor of the academics that we are applying to our students because that has not been in place. Not just academic rigor, but also the and enrichment, and this is where the equity question comes in, in terms of ensuring that all of our schools have access to foreign language and PE and that kind of thing, to athletics and to libraries and what have you, um, and then the social and emotional supports that it takes to make um, children who are suffering with challenges be successful in in school. Those are the things that we are doing and we're pushing on all fronts. And I think when you look at our strategic, um, look at our performance plan, it's literally pegged to the five goals that we laid yeah, out. I, our I, I have no doubt and I've looked at it and that is one, in my mind, one area though. I, I think what I'm looking for is something broader than that, something that engages the agencies that we've talked about in this conversation, that engages um, every aspect of the system, uh, you know, the safety to get to school. All, it's not, that's why I said it's not just your responsibility. Sure. And, and, you know, this, I, I hear you, and I think you're doing a good job. That's why when we go to these schools and I see improvements yeah. because of this rigorous, that, you know, rigorous, you know, kind of standards that you're putting on teachers. But there is a broader effort that needs to happen, and sure. I think that takes a bigger strategic plan. Um, I, you know, we can yes. continue this on another another round, but I just think that I just want to see that level of commitment. Yeah, I mean, uh, the mayor, for that the, bigger plan. Yeah, the mayor has committed to. In fact, uh, a group of us are planning to a broader strategic plan, and so I think you'll see that coming. Great, Mr. Barry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. At the end of my uh, discussion about athletics. Madam Chancellor, you know I uh, talked to you about doing it that way. You gave me what I call a flippant answer. That is, if you give me more money, I'll do it. You know that the council doesn't give money. The mayor can put money in the budget. The council can adjust the budget. But it seems to me that uh, in terms of athletics, uh, three, three million dollars, what? Uh, three point six million. I haven't done the math yet, but out of an eight hundred uh, million dollar budget, it's on, anyway. On a serious, very serious note, what are your plans starting in September to enhance the little bit of stuff that we're doing now in athletics? Mm -hmm. I recall about two years ago. The track coach, Ed Ballou, mm -hmm. uh, was out raising money to get the students to the pen relays. I thought that was awful. I thought mm -hmm. the school system ought to be supplying those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So I, went, I don't want to answer now because it's, it's too, it's, it's not uh, going to get a good, good answer. I want you to spend a lot of time talking to athletic directors, talking to college directors, Mm -hmm. Call to everybody, not you necessarily personally, but yeah. you have their director, mm -hmm. and put together a four-year plan. Okay. I know you can't do all this sure. the first year, yeah. but logistically, you got to figure out how you have inter mural sports. It bothers me. I, every time I go to the citywide basketball championship, um, I just get pissed off because Excuse me, that's how I talk. Uh, at the math, the Catholic schools always win. Mm -hmm. One year, H.D. Wilson girls, mm -hmm. uh, I think won. Mm -hmm. But even if you're, it happens. And we ought to have an excellent program. One, it builds 
team spirit. Mm -hmm. It stopped these warring factions. If you are an a crew uh, in uh, Barry Farms and a crew in Congdon Terrace, and you're on the same team, you can't have much of a crew mm -hmm. because you depend on each other. Yeah. It also builds, uh, gives you exercise that we need for our bodies. It means you have to eat healthy. And also, you can't use drugs too long and be a, a star athlete. So this is a very serious discussion, Madam okay. Chancellor. So take it seriously. Yeah. And I know you will. And put together uh, a plan. I'm not sure how long it's going to take, but let us know but that we can. It has to be done soon yeah. so we can include it in a 14 budget. Mm -hmm. And you've got to fight for that. Okay. Don't let the budget cutters tell you, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. Fight for it. Fight for it. Okay. Fight for it. Now, another area I want to get into uh, is testing in terms of uh, Mr. Katanga's direction. Mm -hmm. I've spent many uh, hours talking to the state superintendent, her responsibility. I said, tell me why we can't have a diagnostic test mm -hmm. every year mm -hmm. so we can measure what people have come from where they were. Mm -hmm. The same not the same series of questions, but the same order of questions yeah. can give you some idea. Because Mr. Catania, the tragedy here, wait till the 12th grade, and students take this state-wide test and flunk it because they're not been prepared to, on during the time. The other thing, Ms. Madam Chair, as you very well know, Chancellor, is that when our seniors go off to college, Look at the numbers. Almost all of them have difficulty matriculating yeah. in these colleges. UDC had 85% of the students at D.C. public school graduating had to have, uh, I, don't, I don't know what you call it. Remedial classes. Remedial classes. classes. Mm -hmm. Prince George's County, same thing with D.C. students mm -hmm. compared to Maryland students. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference. So. We have to prepare our young people. We know how to do that for skills that they can use in, in the world or work. We have to have a, a goal of graduating every senior who starts in our, I mean, every student who graduates, graduates, graduates in our, in our schools and prepared to go. Now, with black students, one of the biggest handicaps is finances. That's another issue that we've got to try to get into. In terms of that. Like, for instance, with our uh, college students, I'm going to advocate that our community college, David, uh, be tuition free. Mm -hmm. So we have no barriers, have no barriers for people. Uh, cities, I mean, states that were comparable size, uh, have, like Vermont, has multiple a number of state uh, colleges and universities. And so I think you understand where I'm going with that. that. Now, the budget. One reason I'm so glad you have Ms. Shepard here is that Dr. Gandhi, in the past, has been derelict in making sure this money was spent properly and having somebody with analysis. I remember Mr. Wetman, who didn't know up from down, was in charge of the whole D.C. school budget. He gave Michelle Reed some misinformation. And therefore, over 180 students, I mean, the teachers were, were dismissed. And you know, I've talked about this budget situation. You said yesterday we were going to have a new new budget format. I'd like for you to uh, describe it. Oh, before I do that, I want to thank my staff, um, Chante Durant and Kathy Arnold and George Smith, but more importantly, Mary Levy, who's sitting back here. Mary Levy has been at, in this vineyard over 25 years. She's seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so I want to thank her for assisting me in knowing all that I need to know about the budget. I know quite a bit. What, what do, can we expect in terms of a new budget format where the money follows the student? And incidentally, uh, Madam Chancellor, I had this debate earlier with you about Wilson and Baloo. You said, well, Wilson, Baloo gets more than Wilson. But you didn't give us the correct information because at Wilson, they don't have the same number, a uh, highest number of 
special needs children where you get special money. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at Baloo's budget, it's not made up only of the local funds. It's made up of federal funds, mm -hmm. uh, Title III funds, mm -hmm. uh, Title I funds, and there's several of us. We want to talk about that a little bit later. But what can we expect in terms of I want Ms. Shepard to answer this question because it's her responsibility. Now, again, the, the, the responsibility for preparing the budget is Dr. Gunn's responsibility. Mm -hmm. For budget format, it's your, it's your decision about how much you're going to spend mm -hmm. in a certain area, but of course how the budget looks and whether or not we can track uh, the money to the student. Ms. Shepard, what can we expect going forward? Thank God for you, too. Oh. Thank you. Good morning, Council Member. Uh, we are in the process of developing the 14 budget. What we will have last year, in conjunction with the Chancellor staff, we produced a budget guide which better detailed how the budget is allocated. We can expect that budget guide, again, which is outside of what's produced in the budget book. I want to concentrate on the budget book at this point. What do we expect differently in the formatting of the budget that's in the book? What can we expect in terms of consistency between what you publish that goes to local schools and what we find out happens two or three months later? What can we expect in the budget format? They're readable, transparent, and not opaque. Okay. For the fiscal year 14, we will see the same presentation in the budget book. That is why we are working on the budget guide. Wait a second. You, are you telling me that this council is going to get the same kind of format that's in the 13 budget and 14? Yes, sir. Well, I, 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 I see you right now. I think Mr. Catania would agree with me on this. We need to have a budget, one which is readable by council members and, and average persons. And two, we need a budget that tracks the money to the student. Give me an example. There's a hundred and three million dollar budget in the add-on part of the budget for special needs. There are 13,000 special needs children. What I want to know, Madam Chancellor, is where are these 13,000 students are, if it's 13,000? What schools are they? We can add them up. I think it may be the number somebody pulled out of the hat, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm looking at, Lois. How can we get that done with the same format that you had? Can I jump in? Yes, yeah, sure. So I think we, don't, we can't control what happens in the budget book, but as Dolores said, this is why we put together well, the budget can, guide. Who, man, who well, can't control it? I don't control but it. Dolores, Dr. Gandhi controls it. Yes. Not right, Ms. Shepard? But. No, no, but. Uh, the that, wait a minute. Is that not right? Well, we attempted to make a change last year when I started. We were yes. not able to make that change, but what we are committed to this summer is working, the Chancellor staff and my office, working together to see how we realign the entire budget so that we have more transparency. Ms. Shepard, none of us on this committee want the same thing we got last year. You say you wanted to make some changes, weren't able to do that. For 14, you've been there long enough, you have a staff to have made those significant changes that we see. The budget guide is generally for the public, I think, and for council members. But I want to know what's in the budget book. That is what we approve. This council and this committee will be approved. And so, um, um, my time is running out. In fact, it has run out 24 seconds. But we're going to get back on that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Berry. Just on this point, um, I, I share your concern and frustration about the budgets because the, the fact that they are not as transparent and easily, easily understood leads many to jump to conclusions. And they draw the, upon facts that they believe to be the case, and they make statements uh, that have become urban, urban myth. And in the absence of true information where we actually know how much each school is getting and can compare it, uh, Mr. Berry is quite right. It is not helpful. So uh, 
what, what I'm committed to doing this budget cycle and my committee budget director will do is we will be having, as soon as we get the submission from the executive, uh, we are doing our best to crosswalk this and we will be having an open house in our committee staff uh, room for any member of the public who wants to work with us while we try to improve it. But going forward in the 14-15 school budget, uh, I expect the same and we'll be working to initiate in the Support Act the same requirements of transparency that appear in the Denver school system and the New York City school system. So, um, you know, sometimes, again, we all need to disarm the past issues between the CFO and the school system with respect to uh, the way money was handled, if we kind of can all just disarm for a minute and focus on solving the problems, I think we'll all be better off. And there's an intermediary step, but I do share Mr. Barry's frustration because that lack of transparency undercuts everything we're trying to do in terms of building confidence and diminishing cynicism in our system. We've been joined by two Ken. members, um, or one member of the committee and one member who is not. Uh, Chancellor, we mentioned that we would take a break at noon, and so if you'll bear with me, I'd like to give each member uh, a, a round of questions. I'll give each of them 11 and a half minutes, uh, and then we'll take the five-minute break, which we discussed earlier, and then we'll reconvene for more questions. On so, the, on the last point, can I just ask for one more thing that you can help us with on the budget transparency piece? Please, but but I, yeah. I do need to yes. defer to my colleagues. Perhaps uh, if you if you'll state that quickly, and then I'll go to Councilor yeah. Brown. The timeline is also the thing that um, makes transparency difficult. We set a budget in March, right, and then schools have to make changes months later once we actually really know what's going on, and that's why there are different sets of numbers. So if we can work together on ensuring that we not just show transparency when we submit, but over time, then but I think people will. Chancellor, I don't. Mean to step on my colleagues' time, but that is not even a third of the battle. All right, because you well, know sure. and I know yes. now that I'm deep into this budget. I see how add-ons yes, are given I'm just saying in on addition each particular to employee that it makes it appear as if that money stays within the school, but as soon as the budget is passed, the money disappears. Uh -huh. So there are all kinds of tricks. Yes. Let's just continue to we smile, disarm, and work through this. I'm How's that? Because I got this. Okay. Okay. Yes. Miss Alexander. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Chancellor, and thank you, um, Chairman Catania, for for hosting this oversight hearing of performance. And I'm really, um, I'm really interested to know. I know that we have done a lot, and we have a long ways um, to go. And I'll, I'm looking for results and improvements, especially in Ward Seven. And as you know, when we've gone through all of the school closings, a lot were due to enrollment. Um, and I have concerns with that because I want to attract mm -hmm. our Ward 7 students to our Ward 7 schools. I'm really excited, and I read in your testimony about Neville Thomas, mm -hmm. of course, how they're achieving and improving mm -hmm. in their test scores and reading and math. And I have to tell you, I'm excited about the new marketing campaign. I saw the video uh, for Kelly Miller. Mm -hmm middle school on Twitter and it really excited me and I think if any parent or student were to see that video presentation of the school, the teachers and the students, that would encourage them to attend uh, Kelly Miller. So I would like to see more of that um, promotion yes. in terms of what the public schools are offering yep. out there mm -hmm. to the public. That was really um, a compliment to you. you. I'm interested to know because I, I, I'm interested to know the status of where we're going and, and how well we've done um, for this year because I don't want to lose any more students and I don't want any more of our Ward 7 schools to close. Mm -hmm. So I want to first ask you, and I know that um, some of my colleagues may have gone through this before, but I do want to focus on Ward 7 as I am the Ward 7 Council member, on the Ward 7 schools. And I want to focus on any statistics that you have, first off, with some of the, um, with, with some of the different um, categories, say expulsions and suspensions. Do we have any type of statistics and how those rates are going up or going down as it pertains to our Ward 7 schools. I didn't bring that information today, but I can commit to get, if you give me a list of what data you want to see for Ward 7, I can get it to you. Right, because now for suspensions, and it's interesting, I ran into a young lady yesterday as we were at the Ward 7 Education Council meeting, and a young lady and her mother came in. She attends a, a, an 11th grader at H.D. Woodson High School. 
whereas she was actually the victim of bullying and the person who perpetrated the bullying was suspended but she's been put out of school mm -hmm. as well and she's the victim yeah. of the bullying but she was put out um, of school as well and I don't understand why that was. I know we want to protect our students but the protection should not lie in her getting put out of school. Yeah, I agree. Um, I just got an email about what I think is the same situation um, and asked my instructional superintendent to look into it for me and as soon as I get the information I can share that with you. And of course truancy and I know you had, yeah. had um, the hearing yesterday. I want to know what the statistics are compared to um, I guess from 2011 to 2012 yeah. and this year as well, yeah. what are the reductions in truancy? Yeah. I, I want to see improvements because yeah. we're putting all these things in place and I want to know what improvements or what, what have you put in place in terms of expulsions, suspensions, truancy, what have you put in place to reduce those yeah. rates? So on the expulsions and suspensions piece, I mean, if you look at our expulsions and suspensions over time, and I, I can get this information to you, we are actually um, suspending and expelling far fewer kids than previously we were. We recognize that putting kids out of school means that we can't educate them. So you see lots more in-school suspension programs in our middle schools and our high schools so that we have the opportunity to try to educate children even though they can't be in their classroom setting and what levels I guess what what's the level whether you would choose in class or out of school suspension? so it depends on the severity of the infraction and the number of days of the suspension so um, for sh we we look at short-term suspensions medium-term suspensions and longer-term suspensions um, and I can tell you what the day thresholds, I can put that all together and show you what we're tracking like over time, but we're reducing the number of our longer term suspensions, increasing the number of shorter term suspensions, and serving them in school as opposed to outside of school. Is there a maximum suspension time frame? Um, the number after, of days? After, 20, uh, after 25 days you are remanded to choice, so you're yeah, a long-term uh, suspension means that you go to our choice program. So after 25 days. Yes. And, well, of course, expulsion is expulsion. Yes. You're out. So I would like to know, has that rate declined? Yeah, we only expel a handful of kids, and it's for real criminal activity. And with regards to enrollment, I mean, has across the board in Ward 7, have our schools declined? enrollment I know there have been some consolidation yeah. so other than the schools that have consolidated where are we with regards to enrollment in our Ward 7 schools um, I don't and on elementary middle and high yeah school. I can get that information to you I don't have it with me I would like mm -hmm. to see those sure. statistics now I want to focus on HD Woodson High School and yeah. I know a question was asked about the stem track yes. from elementary to middle to high school yeah when we built the new H.D. Woodson High School, it was a <coughs> STEM school. That was the plan for H.D. <coughs> Woodson. Yes. And now I understand, I know Mr. P has gone. He's left the school. Mm -hmm. And where are we with the STEM focus? I'm hearing that Woodson is no longer a STEM high school. Yeah. So where are we with the STEM program at H.D. Woodson? So I think we do, uh, we do not currently have a STEM program, an explicit STEM program at H.D. Woodson, but I share your commitment to, we said that we were going to open this STEM school. We actually built a school that is equipped to do all kinds of STEM activities and so we've got to put STEM programming in. Um, Chief Davis and I had conversations with New Tech High School, the New Tech High program, which um, works all across the country to put full out technology and STEM programs into high schools. Um, we actually have another meeting with them coming soon because we'd like them to partner with us on H.D. Woodson to really provide a robust STEM experience. We also asked Principal Pinder um, at McKinley Tech to work with Principal Jackson to understand what we've done at McKinley so that Principal Jackson could start to pattern some of those things and really bring the STEM focus to Woodson. So what happened with that when Mr. P left, who was the STEM instructor or the science instructor that kind of bought in all of these, um, I, I believe he bought in um, different private entities to come into the school and work, and why did all of that 
because one person left. Uh -huh. Why did all of that end just based on one person leaving the school? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I've got to I've got to look into that because none of our programs should be one person based by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I will admit that I don't think that we have provided support st uh, centrally at Woodson to really make it a STEM program. And this is why um, when we met the new tech people, um, I invited them to come and talk to us about helping to revitalize STEM at Woodson. So what is the plan? What You said you're going to engage the principal with McKinley Tech? We've actually, we asked Principal Pinder to work with Principal Jackson um, to understand what how he started McKinley seven years ago. McKinley didn't spring out as a STEM, and we, all, we, meant, we expected it to be a STEM school, but there are um, a series of steps that he followed, and so we want Mr. Jackson to understand how we took McKinley from where it was to where it is. So is there going to have to be additional financial resources that are going to be put I think into ultimately, the yes. And when can I expect that to be done? Well, I, when I find out, my, when I get my budget together, <laughs> we'll be able to see um, what we can do. And in terms of residency, and I'm asking this mm -hmm. because I'm hearing about and this came up, I guess, during the Turkey Bowl and sporting events that all of the teams who won, they were disqualified mm -hmm. um, because of residency requirements. Mm -hmm. Who determines the residency requirement? Is it dependent on the coaches for the residency requirement? No. In fact, we have registrars at each school um, that collect the residency documentation. And, and I guess I'm asking that because it seems like this comes up during the sporting events yeah. and I, I would think that the residency requirements should have been done upon the students enrollment in school yes that is absolutely right um, but when folks present residency forms and we review them um, in many cases the all of the requirements for residency are checked out we'll find out some other way that in fact the residency forms are forged or fake or somebody is using their grandmother's address but they really live with their parents and I think this is the thing that we find out one of the things that uh, where coaches come into it is lots of times um, coaches know more than what a registrar may be able to collect in their paper and once we have determined that somebody knows that a kid is not a resident then that rises to the level of fraud and so we have a responsibility to um, identify fraud waste and abuse and so when we are made aware that the fact that a kid is not a resident we do a residency investigation and if the investigation bears out even if they have the residency forms in, if the investigation bears out that they're not a resident, then we have to act. So what's different? It seems like if a team wins, then that's when someone complains that it, that about seems residency. Like, that, that seems like the case. But I will say that we actually get calls all through the year where citizens will call and say, you know, I actually don't, I know that this kid does not live in D.C., in the D.C. boundaries, and then we investigate. And so when someone knows that, why doesn't the person who is enrolling the student in school know that because from the if beginning. The, because if the student comes with a driver's license or a utility bill with all of the appropriate forms that we we have to take those forms if they meet all of if they put in all of the enrollment forms then we have to take that our residency team audits about a hundred um, cases a year that we just sample and investigate um, but we you know we have these requirements and people are meeting the requirements and then we find out later that um, that folks are in other places I think there are a couple of other things that we can do in some jurisdictions um, they use the the where you file your income taxes to actually establish residency part of our problem is that with the DMV being such a uh, an area where we cross borders, sometimes you have one parent in one jurisdiction and one, who pays taxes in one jurisdiction and one parent who pays taxes in another jurisdiction. We just, I mean, in other places, it's required that you have to have a custody order if the parent, if you are the primary parent, um, and that doesn't always work with us. So we are working within the guidelines that we have, but people are presenting the appropriate um, uh, residency forms. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, thank you, Ms. Alexander. We'll come back after our break for more questions. Okay? Thank you. Um, Ms. Che. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, Chancellor. Good morning. Um, obviously, we're all here because we're all 
committed to improving the school system, our job one, and we have made progress, but obviously we have lots of things to improve. We still rank lower when compared to other states uh, and urban jurisdictions in our test scores and still suffer from low graduation rates, high absentee rates, uh, and so on. Um, now, in the past years, my staff and I have worked closely with uh, DCPS, as you know, in a number of areas, but probably most notably in uh, school health, wellness, and nutrition. And these are uh, areas essential, I think, to teaching students to live successful lives. But sometimes in this era of testing, uh, with the enormous focus that we have on it, uh, health, wellness, physical education, um, and things of that kind are often given somewhat short shrift. So today I will be uh, talking uh, to you about that as one of my topics, uh, particularly in terms of costs for school meals, which remains a major problem. Uh, the current contract we have now is set up to lose money on every meal served so that we're in this odd position of the more meals, good meals we serve, uh, the more money uh, we're likely to lose. But um, more about that in a minute. Uh, the first topic I want to take up uh, deals with class sizes. Now, DCPS has paid considerable attention uh, to inefficiently small class sizes, but I don't know that I've heard comparable concern about large class sizes. Some schools in Ward 3 are under budgeted every year, every year, and as a result end up with too few teachers for the student body. As a result, uh, the class sizes can be very high, uh, and I want to see how we can deal with that. Now, Earlier this year, DCPS shared with the Council copies of a report from Education Resource Strategies, which did discuss ideal class sizes for academic and fiscal efficiency. And the report recommended promoting class sizes in subject priority areas uh, of small size and then permitting larger classes in lower priority areas. And I want to know, is that something that DCPS is aiming to achieve? through the school consolidation plans? Do you, do you think that core classes should be of a certain size? And, and what would that be? So um, yes is the short answer. In our fiscal year 14 budget, the way we are planning, previously we just allocated teachers to a school ba divided by a number of kids. And that actually doesn't take into account the scheduling nuances that have to happen that then often result in those large class sizes. So this year we've taken a different approach to the school budgeting process. We have tried to figure out, okay, how many classes, courses do you need to have? And then how many teachers do you need in order to make that work? Previously, we gave people teachers and told them, make it work in a schedule. But in fact, we've committed to a schedule now where we should not see those kinds of large class sizes. But that, that's a scheduling uh, adjustment. I'm talking about thinking about uh, core classes. Um, and the report recommended uh, increasing the size um, uh, or not increasing the size of core classes beyond a certain number, let's say 25 students. Um, and um, again, focusing on Wilson, they have English arts, language art, and language arts classes that are in excess of 30 or more students. Dozens of classes yep. have more than 30, so and this, it's not a scheduling the, well, problem. Well, actually, this scheduling issue, because we will staff to a different kind of schedule, it will actually reduce the number of class size, the number of those large classes. And in fact, what the ERS study suggested to us is that our class sizes at the secondary level are actually lower than the national standard. And so they, they, we, we staff at 1 to 22. They suggested staffing at 1 to 24 or 1 to 25. We did not, we, we actually are trying to eliminate these 30 class, uh, 30, 30 kid classrooms, and we actually will t pay attention to that in the enrollment reserve that we put aside so that when we have those big classes, we can eliminate them in, in the next school well, year. Well, you're talking about an average number. I'm talking uh, concretely about Wilson High School, and I know for a fact there are dozens of classes that are over 30, over yes, 30. Yes, I agree. Um, and uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of, if you want to speak in general, are, are you willing to support some kind of a cap to ensure that core courses don't exceed some critical threshold, 22, um, 25? I, I am willing to work on that as, as much as we possibly can, yes. We'll work on that as what well. I think our I think our budget will actually, I think the way we're doing school budgeting next year will actually address this problem. If not, we have an enrollment reserve where when class sizes are too big, we can actually add. 
Okay, and, and that leads me, in fact, to uh, a budgeting pro uh, problems, uh, again, with uh, under-budgeting, substantial under-budgeting at both Deal and Wilson, the largest middle school and the largest high school. Mm -hmm. uh, two years ago, Wilson projected and budgeted enrollment uh, was 1,495 students, but it actually enrolled 1,534 students. Mm -hmm. Last year, Wilson's projected and budgeted enrollment was 1,536, but it actually enrolled 1,638, 112 more students. This year, Wilson's projected and budgeted enrollment was 1,650, but it actually enrolls 1,756, 106 more. The effect of this is during the last four years, uh, Wilson has been shorted by about two and a quarter million dollars by not having a budgeted amount for the students that it actually enrolled. And each year, the Wilson LSAT has correctly, they have correctly projected the school's enrollment and petitioned you to change your projections, which you rejected. And last year, you promised me that, well, we had learned from our mistakes and would co correctly project uh, the budget. But this uh, failed again. And there comes a point where I have to wonder whether DCPS is intentionally underfunding schools like Wilson. Um, and you might, uh, you know, I understand, okay, when we see that there are more than we projected, then uh, we have some teachers in reserve. I hear that, uh, you know, these are not appropriate for the classes where they need the teachers um, for a variety of reasons, that it's a, a Band-Aid on a much more serious problem. And I, w I would like to know why you simply don't accept Wilson's uh, routinely higher but always correct uh, um, uh, projections of enrollment? Well, um, I'll say two things. One, I think two years ago, or maybe it was last year, um, for the first time, I'm the person who actually um, looked at our spending across our larger schools and recognized that we were spending tremendously lower in the $6,000 um, $6,000 per student range at DLM Wilson um, while we were getting a per pupil spend of 8000 some and I actually put the floor in which made Wilson and Deal um, get funded at a much higher level than they previously had. Chancellor, can but I interrupt you just in one second though please? You're talking about uh, uh, in, in, and, and you know that's a, a good thing to make sure that the per student amount uh, is, is fair and more appropriate for, for, for the high school. Mm -hmm. I, I'm transcending I'm going that. To, I'm going to the projections. Okay. That's okay. where I'm going next. Okay. But I, I, wanna, I, I want okay. to, I, I also want to, I want to help you understand how okay. I've helped Wilson and Deal get more money. Thank you. The other piece of it but is that, um, is that at Wilson, we also have, to, in all of our schools, we have to look at the audited enrollment at the school the previous year. And one of the challenges at Wilson has been that we've lost 100 or 150 kids in the audit every year because Wilson hasn't been able to provide either the residency documents or the proof of children being at the school. And so we have to mitigate. We can look at what the audit says. We can increase by some. Um, but I actually think, Lisa, how far are we off the Wilson's projection versus what we've projected this year? So they're up this year. So uh -huh. this year they're up by 60 children. What, how many, how, how many, what, what's their, what is our projection right Madam now? Madam Chancellor, yeah. perhaps you can bring your staff uh, to the table. Yeah. And so Come she on. can uh, identify herself and so that the public, uh, We'll have the benefit of her answers. And then, you know, and, and this Ms. year we'll see. If, if we could, I'm going to give you a, a little more time while uh, the ch Chief of Staff is settled, introduces herself, and then if you can proceed. Okay, no, I'm just uh, setting it up uh, for the Chief of Staff. This year, Wilson's projected and budget enrollment was 1650, actually enrolled 1756. That's 106 more students. And the same has followed the last number of years. And in each year, the Wilson uh, projection has been accurate and your projection not accurate. So I, I would like to know why you just don't te take the accurate uh, projection of, of the high school itself. Uh, please state your name of course. And, uh, and respond to the member. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. My name is Lisa Ruda. I'm the Chief of Staff to the Chancellor. The council member is correct. This year that Wilson Senior High School audited 63 students above what our projection was for it. Okay, 
um, as part of reviewing enrollment projections for FY14, the school petitioned to have additional children added or additional students added for the upcoming year. I don't have that information with me, but I believe that request was partially granted. Um, I can't give you the specific, specific number right now, but I know some portion of it was in fact granted in recognition of the fact that the school is growing. Um, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Okay, well, we can, thank you, we can work with you later about, uh, you know, uh, what you're saying and, you know, what I'm hearing from, from the school itself and from the, from the parents there. But my, my question is, I guess, uh, of a different sort, going into where we're going now. Why, given the track record of the Wilson projections, why don't you just simply accept them and base it on that? Why should we always have to be making up, and we never do make it up, okay, never make it up? Why don't we rely on what historically has been an accurate uh, set of numbers out of Wilson? Because we need to take into account projections at other schools. So as we head into next year, School Without Walls is expanding its population. We believe that will attract some of the students currently going to Wilson. Similarly, while not as significant as an increase, as Eastern moves up to add an 11th grade, that too should continue to pull some of the students from Wilson. So we're trying to balance all of our high school populations, but are incredibly sensitive, and as the Chancellor said, the per pupil funding minimum of which Wilson, Deal, Janey, our largest of schools that are attracting students, it, it, it one ensures we don't pull too much from them to, to subsidize our smaller schools, but two, it also, um, through the enrollment reserve the Chancellor mentioned, it allows us to deal with growth in enrollment when it occurs. So Wilson in particular, I know we added two teaching positions in August because what we do for our schools, as the Chancellor indicated, budgets are developed in February and March and, and things change and we want to account for that change as soon as we have concrete information that in fact a school has exceeded its projections, we add those teachers then and there as opposed to waiting. Well, as my time is winding down, um, I want to just say that I think more credence should be given to the Wilson projection. And if you're weighing it off of other projections, um, it's telling to me that Wilson always comes up dramatically short. And having teachers available in August is quite unacceptable. Who are the teachers? Would they have been selected by the school, et cetera? Do they fit the needs that they have? So I'm asking you, please, to provide uh, you know, some greater credence to the projections coming out of the school. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember Che. Um, Chancellor Henderson, we've come to the part of the hearing where we had a previously discussed taking a break to give you and your staff uh, a few minutes to uh, to freshen up and then to return with the questions. So I'm going to take a 10-minute break at Super. this point. Uh, then we will come back uh, with uh, several rounds more. Uh, to the point, though, that uh, Ms. Che raises, again, you know, we have to start uh, tackling some of these items that contribute to the cynicism and the urban myth about our school system, mm -hmm. right? And the, the, the fights between the, the charters and traditional publics and between traditional publics all go back to this audit that we do once a year. Mm -hmm. And well, I understand you have quite a lot uh, academically on your plate and instructions have to be your first priority. I would look for guidance from your central administration and frankly this is an issue for the deputy mayor. So this, this, this I think goes either to the state superintendent or to the deputy mayor for a solution because the, the fact that we can only conduct one audit of both systems per year mm -hmm. strikes me as quite ridiculous mm -hmm. in an era where we have uh, electronic, uh, where we have technology and, and unique identifiers for students. We, it ought not be that difficult to, on a monthly basis, track where the students are. Now, it can be quite disruptive, sure. but this to uh, you know to to to, um, to budget accordingly because there are migrations that happen for a lot of reasons. So let's stipulate that. But you know, if we could build into every budget a certain cushion as a as a starting point, whatever that number is, and I don't begrudge. And then if if the enrollment numbers don't work out, they don't work out. The, 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 the principal may use those funds for enrichment or other purposes. But we, 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 we need, this is where, again, I start, I continue to call for greater engagement above your pay level because you can only manage your uh, enrollment. I think Councilmember Che's point is an accurate one mm -hmm. as it relates to Wilson. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, but it is indicative of a system that you are living under that has one time per year mm -hmm. enrollment audit. Yeah. 
we simply must be able to know on more than one time per year where children are. And I imagine other systems do it. Mm -hmm. So it can't be that difficult for the deputy mayor of Rossi to come up with a system and apply it equally to the charters and to traditional public schools and have the money flow with the students and have us have the capacity to fill in holes as they sometimes exist because her point is an accurate one. It's one I hear from other members and families, principals, teachers, etc. So let me just leave at that. Uh, it is on our to-do list. Ms. Che, thank you for bringing it to our attention. And I'm going to recess. It's 1215. I'm going to recess without objection for 10 minutes. And then we'll reconvene at 25 after. Okay. Can I go to...
Public Oversight Hearing for fiscal year 2012 and 2013. Uh, we trust that the Chancellor and her team have had a chance to uh, take a break and we're ready to reconvene with uh, 10 minute rounds of questions. Uh, Chancellor, I'm going to go into a certain uh, uh, field involving the collective bargaining personnel evaluation system. So that's the front uh, that I'm going to discuss now. Uh, can you update the committee on what the status is of uh, negotiations for the new collective bargaining agreement? One, I understand we've expired our time. The previous one has expired that we're currently operating under. And you are in negotiations for a new one. Can you update the committee where we are there? actually had a number of conversations around the big ideas that we wanted to change in this contract with Nathan and his team. We presented um, a document. We presented a document, um, a proposed contract, about two, two or three weeks ago to Nathan. He has actually just gotten back his comments to us. So we are at the point where we've papered many of the things that we want to do, and um, we're just negotiating at this point. So, uh, Chancellor, I've, uh, I'll share with uh, you publicly what I've said privately, what I've told Mr. Saunders uh, privately in terms of a point of view. Uh, today, you know, we have, a, we have a standing breakfast, he and I, the first Friday of every month, and so just coincidentally was today the day of your oversight hearing. Uh, the issues that I'm concerned with and want to, again, the council, uh, we're not in the negotiation process, yep. but each of us have a point of view about what we would like to see in this agreement. I, I would like to see the negotiated longer school day. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to see the structure for home visitations uh, and the finances that will support the Flamboyant Foundation once it disengages, because I mm -hmm. think that's been very constructive. And I think the flexibility, or, uh, the, the flexibility that each individual school needs to meet the uh, requirements and demands and wishes of the community, these things are very much uh, yeah. on, on my mind as far as this goes. The other goes to evaluation systems. Uh, I want to reiterate my opposition to continuing to permit minimally effective teachers uh, in classrooms, even if it is for one year. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't believe that that is constructive. I embrace your suggestion about a developing teacher model so that perhaps the first few years out of school uh, you are judged slightly differently so long as you're paired with a highly effective teacher. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we need to, I think we've come a long way in terms of standards for teachers. We have mm -hmm. this far to go. Uh, we need a longer school day. Uh, and we need, uh, in my mind, um, some work around flexibility of the school uh, itself, independence and autonomy of the schools itself. Uh, have you discussed, as part of your collective bargaining agreement, uh, your request for chartering authority? Uh, we've had the conversation not as part of the negotiations, um, but uh, Nathan and I have had that conversation. There, there are, as you can imagine, quite a lot of sensitivities uh, around negotiations because it isn't as though, that, and, I, and I trust I'm not talking out of school. These are things that are publicly available. I'm not sharing conversations necessarily that were pr private or confidential this morning. But you know, unfortunately for us in some respect, because our most recent contract was such a groundbreaking, game-changing contract for the country mm -hmm. that it has become a model for other uh, often uh, urban school systems, city school systems that are trying to transform that have been locked in gridlock. Uh, there's a lot of attention and outside interest in our agreement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm hoping, as I made my point to, to Mr. Saunders, that I am unconcerned, frankly, about what you know any uh, any outsiders might think of how we are negotiating uh, this agreement or what its national implications are. We simply want a, an agreement that's going to maximize the opportunity for children to learn. Sure. He is of that same opinion. Yes. So I, I look forward to you know continued discussions on this agreement, and hopefully we can wrap it up, uh, you know, sooner rather than later, because sure. I think that provides um, you know, the framework for going forward. And these protracted negotiations can sometimes become, um, you know become barriers to collaboration and can yes. become barriers to forward movement. So I just wanted to put that on the record. Let me ask about the last time DCPS uh, conducted a payroll audit. And let me set the table if I can. I'm concerned that DCPS is the only agency in the government that cannot tell me with certainty how many vacant positions exist, the length of those vacancies, and when the last time a payroll audit was uh, initiated so that we can make sure that we actually have people that should be on the payroll, on the payroll. 
The last audit, uh, if I'm not mistaken, was a 2007 Inspector General audit which highlighted a number of issues which time will not permit us to go into. And the only way to make sure that we've actually learned our lesson is by having a timely audit. So let me ask you about you know, those issues generally and if you can respond, please. Um, do you want to respond to the payroll audit question? Council Member, Chairperson, I am not aware. I have been there one year and we have not done a payroll audit. What we have done is done some reviews and corrected some things that we've seen in the system working closely with HR. And um, my, the budget staff has worked over the past three years to reconcile actual FTEs and they have made systematic improvements in reducing those employees who should not be on the payroll. Well, let me uh, short circuit, Ms. Shepard, because mm -hmm. I appreciate this, but, but let me share with you just some of the, you know, unless systems change, um, then problems continue. And so the most recent audit, again, it was from some time ago, and this is why I, wanna, I want a new audit to confirm whether or not anything has changed. The, the last audit, we had 90 identified employees who were, you know, whose, whose skills were questionable, whether or not they were actually bona fide employees. We had nearly 1,718 employees who were not validated as bona fide employees, but who were still receiving pay. We had a number of others receiving pay after the termination of their employment date, and kind of the list goes on. And there were recommendations in this report about how um, DCPS should go forward to make sure that this wasn't happening again. And, you know, as every member of the council is looking for more money, and as you are looking for mo more money, it does us no good to pay people who are not qualified, pay people longer than we should, or pay people who are not working. And so, Ms. Shepard, I'd like, uh, between now and our budget hearing, you to be able to talk n next month at our budget hearing about how we intend to make sure that we have a payroll audit or a system with integrity where we also know uh, where our vacancies are and the length of those vacancies. I, and I'm not expecting you to solve this problem in the next mm -hmm. month, but I would like a thorough report on this. What I'd like to add briefly is that Please. when that audit was conducted, we were on a system that was fraught with problems. We, have, we switched to PeopleSoft, and in moving to the PeopleSoft system, DCPS was one of the last agencies to convert. We did clean up all those vacancies, and so that was part of the task that was undertaken, and we continue to reconcile. So the data that's in the PeopleSoft system is much cl is clean, and we, we track who, who is on board, who is left, and we well, have may, frequent... May I jump in in limited time? Yes. You know, I, I understand that progress may have been made, but it's not enough, Ms. Okay. Shepard. Because when we were talking with you about and ask, when the committee asked again the questions which you can find online or in our office about the list of vacant positions, uh, along with the information for each, we asked how long, what, what were the positions and how long they'd been vacant, we received the following response, and it was, quote, we do not currently have a method of capturing time to fill vacancies or positions. And it goes on to basically explain that we don't know where they are and we don't know how long they have been vacant. And so perhaps this is a miscommunication between my staff and yours, but, but so let's clear it up. Can you tell me today how many vacancies we have and how long the positions have been vacant? Uh, once again, we would have to get that information from, from HR. Okay. okay and so, so. But, but again, in the, in the notion of being constructive going forward, that's not we can responsive. Commit to, we can commit we to a plan. Commit. We can commit to a, a, a payroll audit and a plan. Or for just a, a, what we, you know, again, as we restore confidence yep. in DCPS, yes, sure the enough. taxpayers have to know that they're paying for people who are working. That's right. We want to know. qualified and not a, not a nickel right. more. Yep. All right. And, and that's part of managing. If you don't know your vacancies and how long they've existed, it's hard to use your organizational development infrastructure to fill vacancies, et cetera. So this is about organizational sure. improvement. This is a 30,000-foot question. Uh, I also am curious, if you can, in my remaining minute, um, I, I've uh, reviewed and had a briefing uh, on your impact, which is your teacher evaluation system. I understand how it relates to teachers. I want to give you a, a minute to explain if you anticipate any changes to impact and how you uh, evaluate non-instructional staff who are not subject to impact. Mm. Chancellor. 
Yep, so um, I don't anticipate major changes to impact for the coming year. We just made a huge set of changes this past year. And one of the things that we heard um, our staff tell us is you can't move the goalpost every year. Correct. So we made some pretty significant changes this past year, and we'll let those play out. Non-instructional staff actually are subject to impact as well. Um, so all, all of the educators in our school buildings, um, there are 20 different groups. There are rubrics for each group from uh, everybody down, from teachers to custodians, to aides, to everybody. And so they are observed. They have um, different pieces of the pie for impact as well. And most of our non-instructional staff um, are uh, evaluated twice a year. Uh, thank you, Chancellor. This sure. exceeds my round. Uh, we'll now go to Mr. Grosso for 10 minutes. Thank you. Um, I want to do a little bit of reconciliation between your, a different type of reconciliation, between your Consolidation and reorganization plan and your transition plan, um, the marketing and recruitment plan that we just mm -hmm. got. Mm -hmm. um, and and I'm uh, just, I think, to clear up some stuff because I'm not clear on it. Sure. The, the consolidation and reorganization plan states that there is a projection of 55% growth in enrollment from 2015 to 2022. Uh, right? And well, I, I can just tell you, yes. I, I'm just curious. Is there going to be room for the 55% growth if 15 schools are closed? And kind of what's your theory on that? So the, pro the projected growth in student enrollment comes from the Office of Planning as we look at the population growth that's happening in the city. And in fact, one of the reasons why um, it's important for us to close schools um, is so that we can shrink when we have a smaller population, but also that we can expand when we have a larger population. So you'll see in the consolidation plan that there are a number of buildings that we know two years out or three years out we will reopen and we've put those down. We also um, this is also the reason why we're not interested in releasing schools to the deputy mayor for um, education. When we release schools from our inventory, we lose them for 20 to 25 years. And I don't want to be in a situation where 10 years from now we're going to need more school buildings. So do you know exactly where that 55% increase is going to happen we in the have maps. We have maps from the Office of Budget and Planning, and this is the information that tells us that we will likely need to uh, reopen Thurgood Marshall in a few years, mm -hmm. or that told us that we'll need to reopen Van Ness in 15, 16. Um, we have those, that information. Okay. Um, the the uh, transition plan, on the other hand, uh, talks about, um, let me get my words right here, recruit, retain, and enroll mm -hmm. uh, students that are moving from one to another, I think. And I guess I don't understand that terminology. Recruit and retain is one thing. I understand mm -hmm. those two things. When you enroll them all, I don't understand the difference. Like, would you recruit somebody and not enroll them, or retain somebody and not enroll them? No, it, different populations. So at the same time that we want to recruit and retain the young people and families from our closing schools, we also want to continue to increase DCPS's enrollment overall. And so this is why, in addition to everybody only focuses on closures, but we've also expanded the number of seats in a number of our mm -hmm. high-performing schools. So, you know, we can, we'll grow capital Montessori, which when we started a couple years ago, um, we knew would be uh, a choice that families right. would achieve. Right now, it only goes to fifth grade. We will take it to eighth grade, and that we will be able to enroll new students and attract new families. We're opening up, continuing to open up early childhood classes, which will enroll new families in D.C. public schools. The consolidation with Walls and Francis Stevens will actually bring right. new people who previously so, were not. That's the enrollment part. Right. So... You're gonna, you say that you'll be able to retain 80% of the students that have gone, that are going to be in the closing schools. That's our goal, um, yes. So what percentage of the 20% are you trying to, you know, I, how are you touching them individually? I, you know, I, I know it's a defined number. It's not that big a number even. And my fear is that we're not going to have a, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, you know, no, the 20% can't just be blown off. Oh, no, not at all. But we, we can't, we wouldn't by any chance say that we're going to retain 100% of the students. We look back at the data at the 2008 closings and determine that we lost somewhere about around 20% of students from closing schools. But we're actually working, I sat down with principals at receiving schools and asked them to shoot to retain 90% of, mm -hmm. of the folks. We are touching every single family. The whole school community 
community are outreaching. And in fact, our closing principals are partnering with our receiving school principals because they feel like the goal is jointly there. So right. we'll, we'll reach out to every single um, family will cultivate every single family because it's not a one hit thing we have so, to hit yeah, multiple times so the um the chart in your transition marketing and recruitment plan that lists the schools lists the reported enrollment i guess it's the success measures that uh, we're talking about um and the 80 percent capture mm -hmm. i it would be i think helpful to have another column in there that says what you you know what you intend to recruit out of that 20 percent difference well, you know. um, yeah, the thing is we can't, so at the same time that we are ambitious about how many we're going to capture, when I put those numbers in my budget, people are going to say, well, you lost 20% before, so what makes you, you know, what makes you think that you're going to retain, right. you know, right. ten, um, only lose 10% now, right. right? So we're trying to be judicious, but we're going after the whole enchilada. So here's the, a follow-up to that, and I, I love it when you go after the whole enchilada. I think that's great. Uh, um, the, the question is, um, you're going to be working with principals in closing schools to help this effort to retain and recruit. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, at the same time, you're saying to them, uh, we're closing your school, and you might have another opportunity somewhere else or you fall back to your previous level of employment if we can find you a job there. Mm -hmm. I'm very worried that if it's in the hands of the principals that are in these closing schools to do this kind of family engagement that it's going to take, which you talk a lot about, which is so important, um, you know, the student prep, the teacher kind of, you know, how do you keep up morale in mm -hmm. that level of employment to make sure that this effort of recruitment and retainment actually happens? You know, um, I met with, right, as soon as we um, announced the final plan, I met with principals at closing schools and I met with principals at receiving schools. And the principals at closing schools, surprisingly enough, first of all, uh, they are invested in the entire school system. And so they want their kids to land someplace that's going to continue to work that they've done. Darren Slade at Ron Brown said, look, this is the third or fourth closing that I've been through. And in fact, we know how to do this well. We know how to ensure that our teachers are giving our families the kind of confidence that they're going to need to go to Kelly Miller. And so our, in fact, what we've said to principals and staff, principals primarily at these closing schools is, you know, part of whether or not we're going to reemploy you is how well you help us handle a transition for these young people. We're all accountable. Right. Um, I, I guess that, that makes sense. Uh, you have phases built into this plan. Um, one of the phases of the transition actually began on February 15th. Um, what is the current status of that report? Can you report on the midway through that? I mean, you are in phase one, um, you know, and I'm curious where we stand in that right now and kind of how it's progressing. Yeah, so I've asked Josephine uh, Robinson to join us. She's our chief of family and public engagement. Great. So since I've already been introduced. Um, the first phase includes uh, communication that's happening at the schools, and the vast majority of the closing schools and receiving schools have actually sent information to their families via letters um, that uh, that they've shared. Uh, they are they have uh, information about the, the vast number. majority. How many? Uh, I can't tell you off the top of my head. I will get you that. And um, well, that'd be great. I think. Um, Regular reporting along the way will help the committee. Absolutely, so, um, absolutely. And, so they sent letters. What did they send? A letter that said your school's closing. Here's the process. The next yes, steps. Yes, they've sent. You know, as you know, we are closing um, come the end of the school year. We um, are absolutely open and um, focused on academics this year. Uh, want to have a strong school experience going forward, but we want you to have um, all of the information about your opportunities to attend the designated school. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to be helpful. To to you and, in the transition. Um, phase two starts on Monday. How's it coming? Is it ready to roll? So phase two is ready to roll in the sense that we have uh, been working again with the schools uh, to produce. To, excuse me? Can you describe phase two real quick? So you have the document, right? Yeah, I do, the, but the, I just, for the record. <laughs> okay. You know, the people on TV no, can course, see this. No, of course, of course. So phase two includes building the capacity of the identified schools. So we are working to set up a training uh, for those principals around the marketing toolkit that we are developing for them. That marketing toolkit will include uh, things like door hangers and brochures that will be refreshed, really vibrant information that will provide comprehensive uh, information for parents to review. Uh, yeah. They will also have school-based events. So we're working with PTAs 
as well uh, to open up events and activities that will encourage and entice Are folks you, to learn about the school and is, open houses. Is anybody knocking on the doors of these parents that are having this uh, major you know kind of disruption happen that is absolutely the plan and to do one-to-one -one outreach to those families we are going to be plan. calling are every you, one of the students uh -huh. and their families okay. to encourage them so we will have a phone bank that we're every setting single up. one will every be talked one. to on the phone or someone we will, will show up at their to house call every single one. yeah schools, i understand it's not schools perfect have also started this work already so many of the of the schools have committees that they've put together and they've already gone out and started door knocking started making calls they've had open houses mm -hmm. um, we were just talking about Plummer and Davis and I know mm -hmm. as soon as the proposal was put together Riddle Springer and Gray got together on a number of things that they could be Great. working on you know I, I I'm running out of time here actually in fact I am out of time but um, you know I want to state again for the best you know for the for the record that in these situations getting out in front is important and mm -hmm. I think best practice is important and, it, and if if these are the best methods that you can think of, that's great, and I hope they are. But we have, you know, community and family engagement that works in D.C. from what I've heard, and I hope you're utilizing those. I read in the report that there's uh, brochures and yard signs and, you know, other things going on. I, I'm not convinced that's the best campaign. You know, I just ran for office, and those didn't do much good for me. What did good for me was knocking on people's doors and talking to them individually about my mission. Uh, I think it's very similar in this situation. Thank you, Chairman. Right. Thank you for the advice. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Berry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Rand, will you go to the uh, Chancellor? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, this is a chart for reading and math at all of our board eight schools, both charter and non-charter, mm -hmm. <coughs> traditional public education. I'd like to call the uh, Chancellor's attention to Achievement Preparatory School, which is overall 67%. It's the highest middle school achievement in the city. Put the mother thing about it. Mm -hmm. yeah, break down. Right break down right here. Then I actually call your attention Hart Middle School with uh, Mr. Barry, I don't mean to interrupt, but are you are you mentioning the overall proficiency? I I, I believe you're Referencing the yeah. reading proficiency, the overall no, proficiency uh, overall is, 70, is, yeah. is seventy-six point yes. nine. Correct. Let me let me back up, Mr. Chairman, and do the overall proficiency. That helps us a lot better. And you compare Hart, which is a middle school in what eight, at twenty-six percent, mm -hmm. and I could go on and on about these numbers. The obvious thing is that. Take achievement prep. Achievement prep, 93% of achievement prep students are what eight students. Mm -hmm. Also, achievement prep has 92% free lunches, mm -hmm. 285 people. Mm -hmm. And the overall enrollment is, is, is 300 almost. I would like for you to help us understand if achievement prep has the same set of students in Ward 8, or has 92% free lunches, and yet achievement prep has an overall achievement of 76%. I'd like to explain, let me explain why is it that heart can have a higher achievement? We, we well, should. Tell me they have different kind of students. They no, do. I was not going to say that. What I was going to say is we should absolutely be able to do what Achievement Prep is doing at heart. This is why I reached out to Chantel Wright to say, tell me what it is that we're not doing, and we've been working together to try to figure out what we can replicate from Achievement Prep. But the bottom line, Madam Chancellor, is that there's a, a great difference for the same set of students, low-income students, at Achievement Prep. i give you another example. Look at Anacostia. Mm -hmm. uh, high school, a miserable 14% mm -hmm. overall proficiency. Look at blue, 21%. We go right down the line. Garfield Elementary School, 
-hmm. Let's keep going on down to Howard Road, which is another elementary school. They got 21%. You can down to Johnson, 20%. Ketchum, 25%. Martin Luther King, 28%. Kip, Kip, Kip. The same kinds of students, mm -hmm. low income people. Kip, D.C., it is AIM campus, which the chairman I visited, is 72%. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you can't tell me that something is not going wrong on our side mm -hmm. and something's going right on the other side. Mm -hmm. Same set of students, 92% yes. free lunches. Yes. So I would like for you, not right now, I would like a plan from you as to what you're going to do about these low-performing public schools. Uh -huh. uh, in terms of specific programming, et cetera. We got the. Give me another one. Look at uh, Malcolm X, 16%. You recommended that Malcolm X be closed in your earlier round. Uh -huh. And we know the story of what happened in terms of the mayor overruling that. And so if it stays open, you're going to have these students, the same thing. Leckie, which has a number of students from the Air Force Base, 28%. MC Terrell 20, is closed. Malcolm X, Moton, 20%. National Collegiate, which is a, a charter school. Same students, set of students, 46%. You went on down to uh, Savoy, which is right next to Thurgood Marshall. 17.7%. Uh, Simply McClark, 93%. Same kind of students. Simon, I'm looking for Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall, same set of students, same kind of demographics. Mm -hmm. Thurgood Marshall, 75%. Mm -hmm. And you can't tell me, nobody can tell me, Mr. Chairman, that these ought to not be acceptable. Mm -hmm. I'm going to introduce a bill fairly soon, working with the chairman on if he wants to do it with me, is to require you, if a school is, say, below 30 percent, to give us a specific plan, yes, school do. by school, yep. as to what you're going to do to take us up. It'll be 10 years mm -hmm. for some Look at Garfield. It'll be, it'll be 10 years, 10.5 10, percent. It'll be 10 years before that student gets 50% proficiency. Yeah. That's unacceptable to That's you. That's right. That's right. And to me and this community. Uh, I'm going to work with the uh, charter school board. I tell you, I'm a choice person. I believe in choice between charter schools and private schools. Is get them to look at these demographics and urge an additional high school. That's charter. Mm -hmm. In Ward 8. Mm -hmm. If we can find a bill that can do so, mm -hmm. I'm going to do it across the, across the board. Because I don't think these parents, and you don't think so either, ought to be stuck with these low-performing schools. Mm -hmm. Many of them don't have any transportation to get out of these situations. Many of them don't have the knowledge of what's happening. Stanton is an example. Uh, they have increased the parental participation, no question about it. But I'm going to find out if these parents know these scores mm -hmm. and how bad things are. Mm -hmm. And even though they made progress, mm -hmm. up to 28 percent from that. And so that's where I'm going mm -hmm. with this situation. It's just atrocious. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because someone suggested me the other day that I advocate a boycott of these low-performing schools. And I'm not sure about that yet. But I'm thinking I could do something drastic. To get attention to this, not that you need attention. The system, the city needs attention. Mm -hmm. The mayor needs attention. This council needs attention on these low performing schools because they're stuck. And Ms. Ms. Uh, Shea talked about the feeder schools. Ms. Russo, 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 Russo talked about that. Uh, incidentally, uh, Mr. Caruso, I don't believe these projections. Where are these people coming from? 30%, I mean, 30%. 30,000 people came into the city. They're not, selling, they're not settling in Ward 7 or Ward 8 mm -hmm. or some parts of 5 or some parts of uh, 2 or 1. We have low-income persons there. And so we ought to be very careful 
about these projections because I don't see where they're coming from. Um, so the great, great majority of 30,000 don't have children. Only a fraction of them have children. And so we ought to be very careful, Madam Chair, about these projections. And uh, on my next round, I'm going to spend a lot of time on these 40 schools that you identified as making 40 points in five years. Mm -hmm. You know where we are, how we're going to measure it, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the uh, count, I don't know why I joined the chairman. I mean, the chairman in terms of why it is we can't test more frequently. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sorry, count more frequently, mm -hmm. test more frequently too. But I have yearly tests of some kind, diagnostic. We also ought to have uh, at least two or three times a year. We count. That would help us understand. The migration of charter people into public schools and where they went. Last year there were 1,200 students out of a whole bunch of numbers that left the charter school movement. Oh, more than when, that. When, when, asked, when asked about where they went, nobody knows where they went. <clears throat> I think that's a tragedy. And so uh, I, we're on the same wavelength about the problem, but we're not on the same wavelength about the solution. And I'm, I'm telling you, these parents are getting restless. What happens, Mr. Chairman, in a situation that people are in a bad situation, they've been in a bad situation so long, they don't quite understand what a good situation is. Mm -hmm. They begin to think. I was talking to somebody the other day about depression. And this person told me, I thought depression was normal. And it's not normal. So anyway, I'll stop at that. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Barry. It's a point that uh, the Chancellor and I have, uh, have discussed. Um, it's interesting that on Monday of this week that the Public Charter School Board uh, is closing the Howard Road uh, Middle School, mm -hmm. uh, even though its proficiency rating is twice that of Hart and Kramer and Johnson. Mm -hmm. And that is something, Mr. Berry, that is worth dwelling on. Now, let's stipulate that these schools have about the same poverty levels. Uh, yet the Charter School Board is closing a school with a proficiency twice that of our three other Ward 8 middle schools. Now we can quarrel about, you know, self-selection of parents and so on, but I think it's important to just hit this head on and we have to come up with the remediation for how mm -hmm. these three middle schools that come from the same community, the children come from the same community, why they're performing at half the level of a school that the Charter School Board has felt is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Berry's point about KIPP and about Thurgood Marshall High Schools, these kids actually both have higher degrees of poverty than Anacostia and Blue. When you look at the free and reduced lunch numbers, they're either comparable or the charters have higher. Mm -hmm. And so it isn't as if these kids are less poor mm -hmm. and we need to figure this out. And yeah. so, look, we, we'll face it, confront it, and hopefully yeah. fix it. I, I just want to say I don't think that the kids are different at all. I think that we have to figure out what conditions um, are in place that are ensuring that success, and then we have to try to replicate those conditions. I agree. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just one quick point on Howard Road. Howard Road is closing because the chairman of the board and the board Asked that it be closed. Well, they're keeping the pre-K. I'm sorry. They're keeping asked the pre-K. Yeah. They're keeping the pre-K, but they are giving up the elementary and the middle school. Right. And it will be for the charter school board to work with the community to see how those children are transitioned. There are 500 or so, and then that will be their issue. But mm -hmm. I really appreciate the standards that the charter school board is I'm setting. I'm on it. Okay. I'm on it, Mr. Grasso. Ms. Che. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to pick up on that point, uh, because these comparisons are so stark and so troubling, um, it seems to me that, you know, over in your shop, uh, you must have been for a long time uh, trying to buzz puzzle through why you have these disparities with essentially the same uh, students. And I would wonder what, what you've come up with. Yep. So I think there are a couple of things. One, um, as Mr. Katania rightly pointed out, uh, many of them spend more time in school than we do. KIPP does a Saturday academy. They have a longer school year. They have a longer school day. And so this is one of the reasons why when we put aside money with the Proving What's Possible grants, we actually encourage people to, um, to pilot longer school days and longer school years. I think one of the other things that um, we see as a huge 
um, advantage is that many of our charter partners are able to work with the same set of children over a long period of time, right? Um, and we actually get children in and out at various times. And so, for example, um, Hart Middle School got 30 children in the month of January, 30 new children um, from, that actually came from charter schools, right? So that is roughly a class and a half of students that came in in January. We're now held responsible for ensuring that they meet um, particular academic goals with literally three months before the cast comes. And our we're happy to take those folks, okay, but so literally that, we another, don't have the That's resources. another factor. Yep. Um, um, what else would you list? Because, you know, uh, I was going to mention, and, and the chairman mentioned, you know, the, somewhat of a self-selected group uh, with parents perhaps more motivated to try to get into the charter school. Um, but the one f thing that you already mentioned, and I had introduced a bill on this um, yeah, a few years ago, but it got nowhere about longer days, longer week, you know, more time in school, uh, and now maybe we'll have some movement uh, in that direction. Um, and then the third thing was children in and out. Uh, do you have any other major well, I, of difference that you've observed? Yeah, I mean, I think that some of the flexibilities that our charter partners have, so one of the things that um, they are able to do that we um, are trying to do is provide our, our teachers with much more time in professional development activities. Um, we have to, by contract, actually pay for um, all of the time that we, we require our teachers to be in professional development activities. That's not the case in the charter sector, and this is again one of the reasons why in our negotiations we're pursuing some flexibility around mm -hmm. the principal and the teachers because teachers want professional development they right. don't necessarily need to get paid for every hour of professional development they want it and so if the principal and teacher decide that they want to spend more time we want our union contract to allow the flexibility to do that mm -hmm. and mr saunders has been um, supportive of that idea and and anything else um I'm sure if you gave me a little bit, I could probably come up with a few. No, and the reason why I'm going through the exercise is because if we can identify these things, yep. then we could figure out remedies uh, for them. Yeah. Um, the I, I also have been in conversations with charter um, leaders who want to help DCPS ap actually mm -hmm. replicate mm -hmm. what they've done. Right. Um, and so we are trying to work out opportunities for mm -hmm. that to happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, there may be, uh, maybe it's also a, a cultural thing. In other words, when you get into the charter school, you consider yourself somehow special, uh, yes. and you're going to go along with the uh, the ethos of that that entity. You know. Sure. Um, but in any event, I, I think you know, sort of uh, some sort of like comprehensive, coherent listing of these things, and then trying to work through them. Sure. Uh, yeah, and in that regard, together. you know, you mentioned the flexibility. Um, you know, I have spoken to. Uh, and I'm regularly in touch with uh, the schools in Ward 3, and one of the things that they've done, and I think it's uh, an initiative that's quite wonderful, uh, the high school and also the middle school, and on down the line, for their feeder schools, they, they meet the, the school principals and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the instructors, they meet with people in the other schools that mm -hmm. are going to be feeding up, telling them what the requirements are going to be, what the readiness has to be, and making sure that whatever they're doing as they're coming from the feeder schools is adequate for them to be ready for the next step. Yes. Uh, something like that, I mean, I think it's, it's so obvious and, and, and straightforward, but I mean, it should be a, a practice yep. throughout. Sure, we do it. We yeah. actually, not, Ward 3 is not the only um, place that that happens. In any event, uh, I do want to talk about some programmatic changes. Um, what are uh, DCPS's plans uh, for increasing the number of AP and IB, you know, international baccalaureate uh, courses at high schools? Is there uh, such a plan? Yep, absolutely. So um, we put together a three-year IB plan um, a couple of years ago. We actually are on track to having uh, Eastern, hold on. Um, we've actually uh, on the I don't have the IB stuff in front of me but we've actually increased the number of schools that are pursuing IB certification Eastern Brown and Jefferson um, and Elliott Hine are all pursuing uh, certification we have a couple of other in in the pipeline uh, for IB so we're increasing the number of IB schools I can get you a document on that um, on the AP piece we've actually increased um, to over 2,300 students um, taking AP exams, up by about 600 students 
um, since the year prior. Our pass rate is up on AP exams um, by about 3% since 2010. We're at about a 30% pass rate. Um, and so we are actually running an AP Summer Institute in conjunction with the College Board this year so that more of our teachers are trained to teach AP courses so that we can expand the offerings. We're also looking at different ways to provide AP courses because, in fact, there are are schools that can't take advantage of all of the offerings because they only have one AP teacher or whatever. So we're looking at whether distance learning is a way that we can expand access to AP mm -hmm. courses. Um, but we are so you have a plan. Yeah. And, uh, and what is your goal? Do you want what, what do you want to see? In other words, the thirty percent pass rate is sort of so we, 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 we actually it? have an we have an AP for all policy. Right. We the research shows that when more children are exposed to the rigors of AP, even if they don't pass the exam, that that actually helps with their student achievement. So we want more and more of our right. young people. Um, uh, taking, but we also want more of our young people passing. And so right. we have, um, what I would love to do is have Matthew Reef, who is our um, Director of Gifted and Talented or Enrichment Education, come over and brief you on how it rolls out. That would out. be great. You mm -hmm. know, and, and, and you're, you're exactly right. I think when we're more demanding, um, the students respond. Even sure. if they may not actually pass, it's good to get them in that those programs. Yeah. Um, one of uh, the charter schools draws, I think, programmatically speaking, is their language uh, immersion. And I know that uh, DCPS has had uh, success over at school in my ward, Oyster. Uh, is there any uh, plan for expanding language immersion, language um, uh, instruction, you know, yep. as, a, as a magnet for? Yes. So in fact, um, the first thing that we want to do is ensure <coughs> equity and access to foreign language across all of our schools. And so one of, I think that's one of the promises um, of consolidation. We'll actually be able to guarantee, right now only some schools have foreign language programs, others don't, especially at the elementary grade level. So in the next budget, you should see uh, where we're able to guarantee foreign language access across the board. To everyone. Uh, at all of our elementary mm -hmm. schools. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Um, OK, I want to talk about something you know near and dear to me, and it's not yet. Uh, uh, nutrition uh, mm -hmm. it's uh, school boundaries mm -hmm. um, and as you know for years I've been raising the issue about uh, surging enrollment in Ward 3 schools and the fact that the school boundaries haven't been evaluated across the district since the 70s mm -hmm. and then a few months ago you said you're going to address this this spring and you'll issue a report and a proposal around May uh, so I just want to ask you at the outset what's the status of that plan. Yep. So our consultants are still getting data for us. We have to pull together the task force immediately so that we can have recommendations by the end of this year. But um, it is first and foremost on our agenda. Okay. And you know, I really want to know something about how you're involving the public in the process. There's yeah. a great deal of anxiety yes. that you all will come out with some sort of a plan and recommendations, and then here it is. Yep. Um, there's anxiety about you know how. If the feeder patterns change, will there be grandfathering, uh, you know, siblings, uh, all, all of the rest of that? So, what is your plan for bringing um, uh, parents and and the public into yep. this? So, as I shared with you, I guess at the school consolidations hearing, um, I support the idea of having a task force made up of diverse stakeholders from across the city to help us with this. And that's what I just said. We've got to pull the task force together immediately. Um, what our approach is going to be is similar to what it was for the school consolidations, right? We're, gonna, we're doing our best research right now to try to figure out what we think the best set of recommendations are uh, with our consultants. And one of, I think, the interesting things or hopeful things is that we're looking, Mr. Grasso, at best practices all across the country around boundaries and feeder patterns. And our consultants just sent me um, a look-see at what they've done in Boston, where they've been very creative about um, creating zones so that there is not necessarily only one feeder that um, feeds into a middle school or a high school. And I think um, we're trying to not be constrained by our current structure where there's, you know, which is going to rip the city apart. But um, our consultants are preparing a set of recommendations. We expect that that will go to the task force, and that task force will then work with that information, make recommendations, we'll take it out publicly get more information and then ultimately come back at with a final plan only after we've engaged the public in this. Well, I'll have more on this, but my time is over for this round. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Jay. Um, 
Chancellor, I, th I think we're hitting on many of the, the, the high points. Members are actually a nice division of labor in terms of issues that we are discussing. I just want to do a little cleanup on the issue of the transition plans. Uh, the, the big concern is that of transportation, and I think I know uh, that uh, the public would be well served if we could have the point individuals in the central offices <coughs> who are working on transition uh, have their names and numbers available and yep. so that we can post, for instance, I had a number of questions last night about transportation uh -huh. as it relates to Kenilworth, to Houston, Kenilworth, to Thomas. Is, there are some concerns there. And, you know, how will it be organized? You know, where will it be and so on? So I think we have to really, uh, we have to really push in terms of getting that information okay. singularly located where people can, can go. And if we can have a person, you know, who's, who is solely responsible for, to be the intermediary of information, that might be uh, helpful. Okay. Um, with respect to Flamboyant, this is the, right now it's presently in 16 or so schools, I think. Is it 16 or is it, is it 8? No, I think it's 10 schools this year. The point is that it's presently being f funded by the foundation, this, uh, this home visitation program mm -hmm. at the beginning of the school year. Uh, and we have to be mindful that when the foundation stops supporting it, that these costs are going to have to be mm -hmm. assumed and negotiated. This is part of the agreement, again, just for cleanup purposes. Um, the libraries has been a hot button issue. People are eager to see an improvement in our libraries, and you've committed to staffing. But that's kind of only a fraction of the conversation because you can have a librarian in an underwhelming mm -hmm. um, facility and an yeah. underwhelming collection. And so there, therein lies the additional capital costs yeah. of building and staffing and a collection. Yeah. Um, and so I want to be smart about how we use our limited resources with libraries. Um, we had the oversight here in the Public Library Board this week, and it occurred to me that uh, a few weeks ago in conversations with the library board that they actually have a, a really robust uh, online inventory of books and mm -hmm. they manage the number of licenses online, right? Yeah. It might make sense for us to, to partner DCPL and the charter schools both to partner on, on having the school systems uh, inform the library system about what books are of interest and mm -hmm. the numbers that are interesting, okay? Mm -hmm. Because these kids are increasingly reading online through Kindles and yeah. others, and they're not, you know, even if we could afford the hard copy books, it's just not the, the yeah. way in which they are reading these days. Yeah. So the idea would be to have a partnership with the CPS and the charter schools and the public library uh, board. Mm -hmm. to, to, and, and, you know, we, we get too involved in MOUs. We, I mean, the, we make things much more complicated than they have to be. It does not have to be it complicated. It does not have to be complicated, right? Having you know the chief librarians or the the collective librarians of our charter and DCPS schools, you know, start to gauge what their needs are and making sure the central library is buying the licenses for those books and informing not only that but informing the library of, of additional books that they want. Yeah, we've had a meeting with Ginny Cooper, um, and she has made a commitment to opening up their databases to all of our schools. And I don't know what conversation she's had with the charters, but I'm sure if she's willing to do it for us, but it's more she's than that. To do it, for that's them. too passive, and that's the that was the purpose of my conversation with her, both privately and at the hearing. That is too passive, because we can't afford at this point in 120 traditional public schools and 120 charter schools, there isn't the space often and there isn't the resources to build and buy hard copies. Mm -hmm. This is simple. And so, the, the, so having the school systems engaging the library system about what that public education library infrastructure looks like, what the yeah. collection looks like, and how that is managed seems to be way past due. Yeah. So so let's Either. set timetables for this, and let's. Okay. Then I what I need from you is a budget, uh, and I need it from the charter schools, um, for you know what the cost would be of purchasing the electronic devices, that would give kids in fact opportunities. So yep. what would a Kindle for every child cost? Yep. Now we we have safety issues. We can't have them taking them home yep. and so on and so on because of robberies and whatever. But but you know it, it, we it, we it, have that information and we've piloted. We have at 17 schools right now. We bought nooks for every single fifth grader. And in fact, the Junior Great Books program is, is which is a number of really fantastic books are loaded onto the nooks. And in fact, children are high ability readers from second through fifth grade are using these all over the system. In the next budget, you'll see additional funds allocated to be able to expand that program just for the very reason you cite. Well, well you know just. 
by and large, there seems to be, I'm not, I'm not overwhelmed by, by, as I look through the budgets, where technology comes in. Yeah. And so, um, you know, these other tools like TeacherMate and, and others, which some schools have found particularly useful, they're just, they, they are minor costs but mm -hmm. have big returns. Yeah. And so I want to, and that goes into the larger conversation of the integrated learning that has been piloted in some schools about what percentage is done electronically and online and what percentage is done mm -hmm. kind of the old-fashioned way. You can't do it without the technology. Mm -hmm. um, with, with respect to the graduation rates, um, you know, again, in our non-application high schools, we have abysmal graduation rates. And, you know, we had, I don't want to retread yesterday's uh, earth on uh, what we've discussed with, as relates to truancy and as it relates to social promotion. But, but you, you know, Chancellor, our ninth grades are, in our non application high schools, our ninth grades are in uh, peril. Mm -hmm. And I'd like you to discuss what we're going to be doing to change that and turn that around, specifically focused on ninth grades. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we have to do a couple of things. One is we have to make sure that we have interventions in place that can provide those young people with the academic support that they need. We have some models that are working. And so one of the things that we see that works that we will replicate next year is pulling out the repeat ninth graders. In fact, when you have repeaters in the may, same may class. Are, yeah. you, are you supportive of, within these non-application high schools, two, uh, two schools in one? In other words, to have the children who are on grade level and prepared to learn because I think we spent yes. almost all of our resources directed at remediation and children who who can succeed are shortchanged because they are burdened by the kids yes. who are not ready. Mm -hmm. So can we, I mean, and I'll leave it to you for the specifics, but can we talk about, if not this year coming up, the following year, a pilot on running two schools in one so yeah. that we give the kids who aren't on grade level the chance to remediate and mainstream, but we don't hold the other children back. Yes. All right. Do we have budgets on that, or do we have thought? What, what we, is can get, we can get you information on do, what that looks like. we have a model that we can look to from another city that has done that particularly we well? We have models, in fact, right here in D.C. Um, that we can look to for that. Yeah, we can it provide you that It's, information. again, the sense of urgency that we, we need to do this because, yep. um, oh, you know, what I do fear will happen that if we don't do this, um, the trajectory of our public education system will be for uh, motivated parents and motivated kids will start self-selecting even yep. more out of our traditional sure. non-application high schools. And yep. they will be a place where there are disciplinary problems and, and significant special ed problems, yeah. which further hurts the image of the system and our ability to attract the talent mm -hmm. that's going to make the system exciting and truly competitive going yep. forward. And so, you know, I look, I look forward to that at the budget hearing next month about how we are going to do this, as well as reconfiguring our priority towards those children who are ready to learn. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I, yes. you know, I'm frustrated by a system that is entirely directed at times, it appears to yeah. be, at, um, at things that are uh, remediation oriented. You know, and, and even, you know, discussion of athletics, while I support them, you know, um, we, we don't offer the same celebration of children or schools that make advances in the CAS scores. Mm -hmm. We don't celebrate academic excellence in the city. We don't prioritize it. We don't fund it. We don't celebrate it. Mm -hmm. and, and that sends the signal that DCPS, so long as all of our resources, conversation, attention is on remediation, that is not the kind of image that is going to attract high-quality students, motivated parents, or yeah. talented staff. So we've, we've got to turn this corner, yeah. Chancellor. Agreed. I'm interested in how you would propose to do that and which of our high schools, our non-application high schools, would be uh, a, a case of, uh, of uh, first impressions for this turnaround uh, strategy. I'm sorry. Which, which school would you would you uh, identify as a turn for for turn for this turn this two tier strategy this two schools in one strategy? So I feel like we've got to look at all of our neighborhood high schools, right? Because plotting along one at a time is not going to help us get to where we need to go. I think Dunbar provides um, an interesting model that we could easily replicate quickly in a number of our. Um, of our neighborhood high schools that we don't just have to turn on one at a time. Well, um, th though I want to make sure that we, we roll it out right and that we don't engage in a universal experiment. Mm -hmm. And I know you're sensitive to this too, but I, I, I look at these um, at our non-application high schools that we have overbuilt capacity for, mm -hmm. that we, through continued school closures and the attrition of the feeder system, we, we further burden them. 
and that we're going to be left, my fear is we're going to be left with very expensive buildings with very few students. Mm -hmm. And unless we can figure out a way to offer uh, opportunities for uh, for uh, education, uh, high quality education in these non-application high schools, we're going to be in trouble. Yep. And kids are going to continue to self-select, again, in, in the Ward 8 case, to Thurgood Marshall mm -hmm. or to KIPP. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. Um, so I look forward to, to working with you between now and the budget hearing to see which schools, uh, which of these non-application high schools we are going to identify, mm -hmm. how we're going to focus on ninth graders. And in the context, a larger context of making social promotion, you know, uh, less of a requirement. Again, in an informed way, we're not trying to hold students back just because we want to. It's making sure it's using our new CAS system, that'll be three times a year, uh, to, to evaluate the students. And then, um, you know, making sure those who are not on school level are, are given the remediation they need and ultimately summer school. Uh, and I think that will that will go a long way to make DCPS more attractive because I think yep. one of the things that, as you mentioned, for uh, KIPP, for instance, they're able to get the children early and they stay with them, and they they don't they're not constrained by the prohibition against you know having very serious frank conversations about holding kids back or mm -hmm. doing what is necessary to remediate and get them on grade level, mm -hmm. and so you have teachers in you know a fourth grade KIPP teacher is able to teach a children who are more or less very closely aligned on level and it makes it easier to go on to the fifth grade. Mm -hmm. If you're a fourth grade teacher in the district and you've got kids, 20 kids on 20 different levels, it makes it very hard to have a professional lesson plan to, to elevate them all to the fifth grade. Mm -hmm. It's very defensive and not an offensive strategy and again it continues to deprive those children who are ready to learn and who can learn from the chance to get the benefit mm -hmm. of the focused attention that they deserve. Mm -hmm. All right. uh, we'll, we will have, Chancellor, one more round. Okay. Uh, I promise that we try to end around 2, and as it is, we may end around 2.30. So I appreciate your patience. Uh, we'll go to Mr. Grosso. Mr. Grosso. Thank you very much. Um, I've got it all figured out. Okay. I'm just right. kidding. That's great. I'm happy to work together to do it. Yeah, right. Um, uh, I want to follow up on the uh, recruitment just for another second. Um, I, I finally figured out what I wanted to say. The, uh, the consolidation plan talks about moving from Davis to Plummer and retaining 142 of the 178 kids. It's very specific. I, I really like the specificity. My question then becomes, how specific are you and where is that information in a similar chart for recruiting new students into every school across the city um, and doing that, you know, this year, next year to yep. get to your 55% increase. And is there a, a like, yep. a we have a, more we have a team. We have a team of people um, whose entire um, job is to focus on student recruitment. Um, we've worked with a number of schools over the year. We have targeted schools that we help recruit. Um, and we see, in some cases, we see mixed results. In many cases, we see the schools that we work with on recruitment actually increase. In some cases, they stay the same. So Smothers is a great example in Ward 7 um, of a school that we actually helped with recruitment over the last couple of years, and they've been able to increase their recruitment. And, uh, increase their enrollment numbers um, and so we're, that helped in the decision to um, to not close it ultimately um, right. even though the enrollment was low. Do you but have one for every school? So, so elementary, middle, high? We don't have a plan for every school because uh -huh. some of our schools are over enrolled. We're really looking at sure. um, targeting the schools that are under enrolled but we also have to be frank, right? Part of the reason why people are not coming is not because we're not knocking on their door, it's because I can't, I haven't been able to offer them the foreign languages that they're interested in or arts right. because that's what their students are interested in and so that's really why in our budget what you'll see on this other side of consolidation is a much more robust set of activities that um, parents should feel confident in and want to bring their kids I to. I think that's right I, and I, I think that the question goes to that I mean you have to target where you're doing this recruitment I think that's really important and it takes more than just like you said, knocking on the door, it takes a lot of a lot of kind of programmatic effort as well. Um, and to that end, I wanted to ask you. You know, we recently corresponded on the Stanton School After School Program, and mm -hmm. in that correspondence, you mentioned to me um, that each school is responsible for the nonprofits or the engagement that they have with outside entities, mm -hmm. and that it's really not DCPS that I know it is and isn't, but you know, yeah. it's not the central office that does that um, because. Like, how many 
are there? Like yep. this goes to my question about making sure there's robust programs yep. in every single pro you know yep. school to recruit better. Yep. How do you track them? How many outside entities are working in our schools? So what our, fam what our p director of our community partnerships does is actually look out at all of the schools. Um, and this started, I guess, when I was the deputy chancellor and partnerships were under me because we know some schools are flush with partners and other schools are not. And so we um, did a survey to figure out who had which partners. And as new partners come and say we want to work with D.C. public schools, we say this is where you should target. But um, at the same time, a partnership is only going to work well if a principal and a school community feel like that's mm -hmm. the partnership that they want and need. We wouldn't have anything to do with pals going to Stanton. That's the, that right. is a match that they made. And so I would never want to tell my principal, you have to have this or you don't have to have that. I want them to find the partnerships that they think but you would, the um, experience. What's the mechanism for you to intervene if it's not a good program? If, if it, uh, you know, are you measuring outcomes on these after school programs or, you know, tutoring? programs so, and then stepping in and saying you cannot continue in this school because you're not helping the situation. So for our uh, after school programs we have a process where we vet the community based organizations mm -hmm. um, to make sure that they are meeting our standards before and we go through that renewal process every year. Um, at the same time there are some nonprofits who work with our schools. We don't pay them anything. There's no what have you but the principal will terminate a partnership if it's not actually working for them. So in your standards that you have set for these, you know, nonprofits or whoever they are, do you have licensing requirements? Do you have, um, you know, background check requirements? How open door is it at these schools? Because, you know, we go to these school visits and it seems like everyone has a different partnership with a different entity. Um, and, you know, I, I don't necessarily say we have to have the same one in every school, mm -hmm. but I sure would like to know that there are high standards yep. for each of these. So um, for anybody who volunteers in our schools, they have to go through a background check. So at the very least, uh, we're keeping our students as safe as everyone, we possibly Everyone, even the can. tutoring program yes. after school and everything? Yes, they come down to our office and we provide the background checks. They fill right. out an application. We'll That's work good. with the nonprofit. In some cases, we'll schlep our fingerprinting machine down to wherever they are and do their volunteers. Um, but we, you know, again, for our after school program where there are clear outcomes, we have a clear set of standards and I can, we can share those with you so that you see what community based organizations need to do. Same thing with those that work with us over the summer. But then there are other nonprofits that provide other kinds of support. So say Medias Kids, for example, mm -hmm. they're an organization that if your kid, if a student needs glasses or a coat or what have you, right, they provide that. There are no standards in place to assess whether or not right. they are good, no, bad, or ugly, and we want to keep them going. Interaction, you know, but yes. when they have a, you know, one-on-one -on -one relationship uh, or some kind of role in their education, I would think there'd be standards. Yes, and, absolutely. Know, um, do you know how many organizations there are? That work with our schools? That's right, yeah, oh, in, in the school. Hundreds. hundreds. Do you have an exact yes, we number? Can, we can give you a list of you which list? schools are which yeah. have which partnerships. Uh, perhaps the committee already has it. I, I don't know, but it would be good to see that. Um, no, it's also on our school scorecards. Every scorecard will tell you which partners are at which schools. And do you grade the after school programs as well as the performance uh, in the school during our the day? After school, our after school programs, the coordinators um, actually evaluate the teachers and the aides who are participating in the programs. And again, we vet the community based organizations each year to determine who can provide after school services for our students. So um, how about for things like uh, college prep and access at that, at that level? It's a yep. little different. And how many organizations are doing that and where, where does that kind of so, standard lie? Yep. So at one point there were 17 different college access organizations providing college access stuff in our schools. We did an audit maybe four or five years ago, and they're all piled on top of each other in the same schools. Um, we've actually worked with a consortium of college access providers to try to be more thoughtful and strategic right. about who is where and providing what support. Where's that so, done? Is that done in your office? Or it's in, in the Office of Aussie, Partnerships. Or, or in Partnerships, okay. Yep. Does OSSI have any role in any of this kind of stuff that you Not know? in the direct partnership no. that happens at the school at the level. Schools. Um, you, you can understand my fear here. I mean, I think we should take advantage of as many nonprofit partners as we can. Sure. Um, but I also know from experience that they're not all the best thing for our kids. Yeah, and so absolutely. I, I get really worried. Um, I, I like them to prove themselves just like the teachers have to prove themselves and you have to prove yourself yep. and I have to. I think this is one of the, the things that Often what happens I'm is they just, you know, it's benevolent. Oh, yep. we're coming in to no. save your school. And it's like, hey.
hey, yo, we don't need that kind of saving. Yes, absolutely. And I think our, our school leaders have gotten much more savvy around what partnerships help and what partnerships don't, and they're not afraid to tell people if this is not helpful. Right. I think our Proving What's Possible grants also forced people to then say how these different partners were helping to move towards student achievement. Otherwise, money wasn't available. I appreciate that. You know, I think it's extremely um, – extremely important to just keep an eye on it and report out on it you know in, in the same context as reporting out on what's going on in the schools uh, with other programs and with academic achievement these are the other things because you know these core competency things that that you work on are important um, and that's where you spend a lot of your effort but these other things that are outside of that um, are also important and, and there's kind of tutoring I think and there's um, you know, the, certainly the food program, the, the, you know, substitute teaching program, all the things that you have to do to keep the whole thing moving forward mm -hmm. um, is complicated, and I hope that you're, I don't know, taking, taking that all into consideration. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll have some more questions. I'm going to go in a different track, so I'm going to uh, wait till the next round. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Grasso. Uh, Mr. Barry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in terms of Ms. Grosso, about marketing, let me tell you in what eight, but makes it a failure. What makes it a what? Make it a failure. Oh, okay. It's not going to work. What's, what parent is going to take their kid out and be attracted to Garfield uh, with a score of 10.5% overall? Mm -hmm. Our children and a family are valuable to the parent family. Mm -hmm. We want the very best for our children. Wow. You want the very best for your uh, children. I want the very best for Christopher uh, when he was in public education and private education. What disturbs me, Madam Chair, we're not going to solve it at this dice, is that we all agree, educators would agree, Mr. Saunders would agree, that the adult in the classroom is the most important adult in that classroom, mm -hmm. which is a teacher, a teacher imparting knowledge. If you look at the system we have here now, there are 741 highly effective teachers. Out of that 741, what do you have? 50, 50 in Ward 8 which is a 6.7% of our teachers. Mm -hmm. And overall, only 50 out of 741. Mm -hmm. In one particular ward, you have 426 highly effective teachers. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, Madam Chair, Chancellor, what are you going to do? I know there's some questions about impact, et cetera. But educators would tell you, you would tell us, we would tell ourselves, that where the problem is the greatest, you need to have the most effective teacher. Mm -hmm. In our low-income communities, you look at every school that's a feeder pattern or not a feeder pattern to a low-income school. i give you a specific example about that. You have Imagine School right across the street from MLK, mm -hmm. and they recruited a significant number of students from MLK, which has a uh, uh, get it right quick. Imagine twenty-eight point. Yes, go ahead. And King. King is twenty-eight point eight. Twenty-eight point eight. Mm -hmm. There's some other examples. What parent, if they have a choice, is to advocate that their sons and daughters go to Anacostia, which has, is 18, whatever it is, uh, below 16, reading points, or Kramer, you go right down the line. And so what I want to know from you, what do you intend to do within the union contract to get many, many more highly effective teachers, either built from those that are there, or transfer it from other places. What do you intend to do? So I feel this like, is unacceptable. So this I feel like I can't. While I can't divulge the 
particular strategies that we are negotiating around this, um, this is a significant part of the conversation in our negotiations. We are looking at a number of strategies that would increase the number of highly effective teachers in our highest need schools. That's a question of transferring those that are in the system. Not necessarily. What is it? Well, I, I, this is what we're negotiating. I understand that, so. but it tell me how does a union contract affect an interim <laughs> teacher? And what I will say to you, which you, you know, I just read on, I've, I'm a, if it takes law, if it takes legislation, you ought to be mandated when a person joins the D.C. public school system, a new person, mm -hmm. to send them wherever you think they need it. And you and I have disagreed on it, but I'm a, if it takes legislation, they do it. When a mo police officer enters the Metropolitan Police Department, the chief can decide where she or her goes. Same is true with fire. Same is true with any organization within DC, I mean, in terms of the DC government. When somebody goes to work for Dr. Gandhi, uh, he can decide uh, what he is attracting them to. And so we're going to have a, a we really don't have a serious problem until you come up with a solution. Let me tell you what we are doing outside of the union contract. We've actually hired a team of recruiters whose whole entire goal is to find the best talent for our 40 lowest performing schools. In fact, when they go after these high performing teachers, teachers who have a track record of success in other school districts, all they are talking to them about is our 40 lowest performing schools. And so we're actually recruiting new people who have experience and who have a track record of success to go into our lowest performing schools. And I think that is part of the solution. Madam Chair, there are more than 40 schools that oh, are performing. Sure. You know that. Yes, and absolutely. With that. The other point I'm making, that every charter school almost in the city has a waiting list. I will get that list from Scott Pearson to give it to you all so you can see that if more students could get into these charter schools, they'll be going. Mm -hmm. I don't blame these parents. Uh -huh. You know, stuck in that low-performing school with yes. low-performing thing. So that's, that's straight about that. Secondly, Mr. Jackson has been very, very successful when he's done at Dunbar. Uh -huh. And I asked you about when you're going to transfer that over. It doesn't take one penny to transfer an attitude on the part of the principal that permeates down to everybody that academic achievement and truancy it's all right, but it'll take one penny for that. It might take some money for the twilight uh, situation. So I would like for you to immediately look at all these high schools and see what you have to do to transfer that philosophy. Well, it's, it's that leadership matters, and this is why we have paid a ton of attention to who is leading our schools. How many, how many principals have been a turnover since 05? Oh, since 05, oh, probably oh, nearly all of them. The last time I saw was 140. Mm. Principals, wait a minute. Principals that have been at a school and removed from that school out of the system. That so could we, be. We, we, well, you would get us some numbers. Sure. On the number of principals. Yeah. That's been I mean, we've turned over that. the vast majority well, of Well, that's principals. enough of that. I, we, okay. I'm doing something else. And the other point I'm making, again, we didn't have a chance to talk about these 40 schools and what happened. Uh, I'll ask you to give us a report on what you're doing over there. See, my job is to represent the constituency in Ward 8. Mm -hmm. All 73,000 people in all aspects of their lives to do all I can to fight for the quality education, which you would agree with, quality everything else, fight for jobs, fight for affordable housing, mm -hmm. and all of that, and fight to reduce poverty mm -hmm. uh, in town to Ward 8 and the city. And unless we all band together to reduce poverty, it has its impact on the criminal justice system, sure. has its impact on the health system, has its impact on uh, a whole range of mental health systems, is on the substance abuse system. It has its impact right across the board. Mm -hmm. Experts have said that, and non-experts who have been in the field say the same thing. So what I'm going to ask you to do is, is give us a report on that. But overall, I want to commend you for what you've been trying to do Thank and you. have done. I'm going to criticize you for that, which you have not sure. done, as you know. 
I'm in the process of trying to, won't you help in this, trying to develop a, a, a scorecard for chancellors. Okay. So that the community would have an input into the, it'd be very, very specifically detailed mm -hmm. into the chancellor's movement and going forward. Not you necessarily, but a chancellor, whoever it is. That's the fine. The same thing is true. Uh, you ought to develop an instrument uh, for the measurement of the effectiveness of teachers that students can do as long as it's fair. Also, a measurement for the community to judge uh, principals in terms of what they see a principal is doing. So we have to change the culture of this system. We have to get away from reform because it's been a failure among low-income people and get into transformation. We need transformation. I think the uh, silk one is, is an example of that. In this, in this cocoon is an ugly individual, but it comes out a beautiful butterfly. So we want our school system to be transformed, mm -hmm. to meet the needs of all of our students with special emphasis on those who are in need of help the most. And finally, I don't have time, Mr. Chairman. Can we have one more round? Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Barry, we, with the Chancellor's uh, indulgence, we will have one more round. After I, this I like that. Okay. And we may, we may shorten it, but uh, we will, there will be an ample opportunity for a few more questions. Sure. Thank you. If, Thank if you, the Mr. Chancellor. Well, yeah, I'm good. All right. All right. Let me move to um, Ms. Alexander. I'm trying to be sensitive to the Chancellor because while we have 10 minute rounds, she has our rounds. And so, you know, at some level it becomes hard to be sharp and have all the answers to the questions. And I guess She's up to it, Mr. we can wear it out over time. But, Thank uh, you. You know, wanna, I want to definitely make sure she shows up Monday. So let's. Uh, <laughs> let's I'll be back. Let's, let's, uh, let's uh, uh, have then one more round after this. But let me go to my colleague, uh, Councilmember Alexander. Thank you. Uh, with regards to, and, and while we're talking about the highly effective teachers, what are we doing overall to retain teachers in our um, D.C. public schools, and not only in our schools, but in our specific schools, like a teacher is not there for a year and then leaving the school system. What are we doing? Because I think a lot of the highly effect, a lot of the effectiveness has to do with retaining teachers yes. in that school, knowing the environment, That's right. knowing the parents, knowing the other teachers in the school. Yep. What are we doing to retain teachers in particular schools? Yep. And I'd, I'd say about a five-year retention would probably show some improved results. Yeah. So um, a couple of things. First, at the district level, um, now that we know who our highly effective teachers are, we can actually target them. We do a campaign at the end of every year to send letters to them to let, we, let them know that we value them and we want them to stay. And if they're thinking about leaving, we'd like to have a conversation with them to try to stave that off. We do a standing ovation for DC teachers, as you know, to help show our very best how much we value them. Um, there was a report that came out um, by the New Teacher Project earlier this year, which shows that DCPS actually retains more of its high performers um, than most other urban school districts in the country, but the challenge that it mentioned was that there are lots of things systemically, but at the school level, um, principals don't always tell their best teachers that they are the best and they want them to stay and create those kinds of environments. So we've actually provided that report to all of our principals so that they have a clear idea of what the mandate is, but more importantly than that, at every one-on-one -on -one that I've had with principals th at the beginning of this year, we now look look at their retention of highly effective teachers over the la course of the last year. And so if we see a principal who is having fewer, retaining fewer highly effective teachers, then we set that as a goal with the principal. Um, and so, and we empower principals, we get them to talk to the principals who are actually retaining highly effective teachers so that um, we're sharing, building our capacity and sharing best practices. And I know there was a concept at one point to give the bonuses for the highly yep. effective teachers or even to go to a lower performing school. Yes, you, school. you get so, effectively double the bonus if you're in a low performing school. So what has been the, I guess what has been the result? Because I know that there, there are different factors yep. at different schools. Yes. So if you take a highly performing teacher from say a Ward 3 school, and then you take that same teacher into a Ward 7 school, I don't think that, that necessarily That's uh, right. 
you know, uh, it necessarily um, that's confirms right. that they're going to be successful there. That is so, right, and that's the reason why Councilmember Barry and I disagree on forcing teachers to go to a particular school. It's about fit. It's about whether or not that teacher wants to be there. It's about a lot of things, but what we have found is um, with the bonus piece, it's actually helping us to keep highly effective teachers in low-performing schools. Previously, because there was no difference, they'd actually go to a higher-performing school after a little while because it'd be easier or because of whatever. And in fact, what we're finding is we're able to retain more of our high-performing teachers. In our now, we got a long way to go, but the simple fact that the, the valve is not spouting outwards is important. Now, because I can agree with you, if it's working, I don't want to mess that yeah. up. So, I mean, I'm not going to be selfish and say take them all out of the schools where they're working and yeah. put them in the schools that aren't working. I want you to put the same um, performance levels at the schools yes. <laughs> where they're not working. Yes. So, I, I we, just, you know, what do, what do we need to do? What is the difference? Or I mean, what? So, I think, uh, I mean, when teachers leave schools or leave education, they usually talk about the leadership being supportive of them. They talk about the school culture being a place where they can feel like they are successful. And this is part of the reason why, in fact, we have replaced the vast majority of our principals, because we have to have leaders who actually know how to create an environment. There are systems that you put in place that make a school um, well run and orderly and provide teachers a better opportunity to be successful. And that's what this is, I mean, that then affects truancy, and this is why, you know, we're pounding on this school culture piece and the academic intervention piece because if we have great leaders who are creating great environments and teachers feel like they are supported in getting professional development, oh, and you could make more money if you're in a school where you're needed most, we actually think that that maximizes our chances of getting the highest performing teachers to our lowest performing schools. And we have a challenge, and I'm going to scold um, even some of my own constituents because I went to a Ward 7 Education Council meeting um, yes, last evening, and Councilmember Catania was there as well. When we had the schools closing, there were hundreds of people mm -hmm. who came out to the meeting. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, nothing was going on other than we were having our monthly Ward 7 Education Council meeting, and I could count the number of people who attended the meeting. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I mean, I'm going to scold I'm going to scold my own people because we only come out, we have to continue yeah. to come out in good times and bad times, or mm -hmm. if we're really serious about education, we need to come out. Our community needs to come out. And I can say we were not at the meeting yesterday, and this is our Ward 7 Education Council. Um, all the, all the um, officers were there. Sure. But there were not a lot of community people there. There were not a lot of parents there. There mm -hmm. were not a lot of students there mm -hmm. um, because there's not a crisis going and this on. Is, this is still an important time because we have the opportunity to, as we move into next school year, to really craft some of the things. I mean, just because we didn't, um, we didn't keep every school open in Ward 7 and, and honor every, of, every one of the proposed plans, there are opportunities for us to see some of the things that the Ward 7 communities demanded in the next budget, and we're working on that. But we need folks to continue to engage. To continue, and I agree with you. Yeah. And we have to, this is even more a crucial time to That's come right. out and show that we're serious. But what are we doing, or what are you doing in terms of parental engagement? I know our parent resource center closed in Ward 7. Yes. So what are we doing? Because maybe we need to do more to engage our parents yeah. and our students. So I think the revelation that we've had over the last five years about parent engagement is that parents don't just want to come out for PTA meetings and whatnot. Parents are really interested in coming out and engaging when it's something directly tied to their student, right? So we see it at in athletics and theater and, and those kinds of enrichment things. When our children are performing or showcasing, then our parents come out. And so our schools have actually been really thoughtful about increasing parental engagement in, in those kinds of programs. But I think what we've learned around what we can do around parental engagement, we can't, we're trying to teach kids how to read. We can't teach parents how to read at the same time. What we have found is the best way to engage is for teachers to actually work with parents on skills 
that they could be doing at home with their young people, and that's what the Flamboyant Foundation work is. Th does your office assist any with building a PTA or yes. with giving yep. them resources? So we actually, that? Josephine's office, the Office of Family and Public Engagement, they do um, capacity building calls with all of our PTA leaders. They actually make sure that um, every school has a PTA or supports um, leaders who want to get a PTA started and LSATs. But yes, we provide a ton of support around getting those groups up and running. But I'm telling you, the radicalness that we've seen around parental engagement is with this model that the Flamboyant Foundation has shared with us. And it's not just the schools that we're paying to partner. So I got an email from Marie Reed, which is not one of the Flamboyant schools. But in their cluster meeting, when the Flamboyant schools were sharing, um, and we actually brought Flamboyant to speak to all of our principals, um, the principal there said, well, I'm going to try to do these academic parent team teacher meetings too. They, at their last, at the back to school night that happened, I guess, this Monday, implemented the ap academic parent team teacher meetings without even being trained and saw a tremendous amount of uptake in parent engagement. So we've talked to the Flamboyant Foundation about doing, I asked them to do this a couple of years ago, we didn't get it off the ground, but to do a conference, we can't, we can't hit every school right this second, but we could do a conference for any interested schools to come so that we train them in these techniques around home visits and around academic parent-teacher team meetings because they're working. And I would at least say to do it at the middle school um, level in high school, it seems like there is a lot of engagement because the children are so young in elementary school. Mm -hmm. So there is more of engagement there, but when it's middle school and high school. I went on a we home could... visit to a middle school student's family on Monday or Tuesday, and the way these teachers interacted with the parent, what they shared with the parent about what the parent could and should be doing was absolutely amazing. And the parent was right there, absolutely, like, to just let me know what to do and I'll do it. And what resources, or is it incumbent upon the principal or teachers or who to bring in, or the community to bring in creative partnerships in, in our schools? It's all of us. Um, we get partners who approach us or we go out and solicit partners at the central level. Partners go out and engage with schools and then in many cases schools will go out um, and partner with organizations that they think will complement the work and that they're doing. I know my time is up but I would like to know from each Ward 7 school mm -hmm. what was at least one creative partnership or implementation yep. so of we can, a program outside of the regular curriculum. Sure, we can get that to you. And on our school scorecards, all of the partnerships are, are listed. But we can get you um, a list from our Office of Community Partnerships. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Alexander. Uh, Ms. Che. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to return, if I could, please, to the issue about the school boundaries and the report. Um, that you all are uh, working on. Uh, I had asked you about the parental involvement in the, uh, in the process, um, but I wanted to get to something um, more specific about that. I, I think that as this group is studying the issue, I think that they really ought to have the parents and the community involved on the ground floor. In mm -hmm. other words, they should be, as part of their study, they should be going out and touching base with parents and communities about what it is they are most concerned about. Be in other words, that shouldn't come in later after they make a report or make recommendations and then you go out and you hear from them about what they think about it. I think they should be part of that that foundation and is there any possibility that that could happen? Yes, and it is happening. The consultants that we're using are Mary Filardo from uh, 21st Century Schools Fund and the Urban Institute. And so, um, to my knowledge, they have actually been attending um, community meetings and education council meetings and SIT team meetings um, to understand what parent concerns are so that as they are doing this research and making recommendations that um, they're informed by that. But yeah, we can and um, figure out how to ramp that up for sure. Well, that that would be good because, as I said, uh, you know, once you broach this subject, and, mm -hmm. and I'm grateful that we're finally turning our attention to it, it creates a great deal of anxiety. Sure, I know. And so if there's an opportunity for people to come and not just, you know, maybe in the narrow confines of a, a PTA meeting or something like that, but in other words, going out to the community saying, look, we're looking into this now. Mm -hmm. Here's what they've done in Boston. Here's mm -hmm. what we're thinking about. Yep. Here's, what do you all think about that? Yeah. And that could, you know, be part yeah, of the process. We could process. do that. Okay. Sure enough. Um, what's the current timeline for the plan coming forward? Um, we hope to have a plan uh, by the end of this school year and will constitute the task force in the next 30 days. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you know, and 
somewhat related to that, I wanted to ask, uh, because this has been suggested many times, uh, that, that the district should convert Ellington in, back into a traditional high school and then move Ellington to a new, more central facility. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have uh, some uh, parents uh, fr from out of Ward 3, but you could add Ward 3, I guess, um, about how they, uh, the children have to commute uh, um, at least an hour each way to attend Ellington. Georgetown has no metro uh, and few transit options. Uh, a centrally located Ellington would uh -huh. be more attractive uh, across the district. Is there any thought to this? Well, I think that that ship has already sailed. As you know, um, the architectural plans have been completed for Ellington. And in fact, um, there are members of the Ellington community who have vigorously opposed moving Ellington to a different site. We're now at a point where we're about to select an architect. And so um, the, the plans for the, if we're going to get started and meet the timeline that we committed. No, but if the school, depending, I mean, is, is the programmatic aspect dependent upon architecture? It is not, but we made a commitment to the Ellington community that, um, and in fact, we pushed them back a year on their modernization. And, um, and so we are fulfilling the commitment that we made, which is that we would modernize Ellington so that it could actually, so that the architecture could um, support the programmatic activity. And um, I've gotten, in fact, tons of, of feedback from um, Ellington families and the Ellington and people in the community um, that they would like Ellington to so stay the where it is. That that's not going to happen. That's right. Okay. Um, all right. Let me turn, please, to. Oh, I, I did want to ask you. You had said earlier. Someone said earlier in the hearing uh, about a projection by Office of Planning, or even in your strategic report, about this 55 percent increase in student enrollment uh, over the next what? 20 years. 20, 10, 20 years. Yeah. Um, and uh, in that regard, is that increase in both traditional and charter, or, or just yeah. traditional? No, it's citywide. Oh, citywide. It's the okay. growth of students, right. so public school age students. When you're thinking about these uh, uh, boundary concerns, how are you going to factor that into it? Factor the, the projected increase in enrollment. Yeah. So, I mean, this is the challenge. We have to be far more creative, and this is why a one to one feeder may not be the right answer. Um, as I said, we've looked at zones, for example. So, you might have um, a number of, of options, right? Schools of right in your neighborhood, not just one. But, I mean, you're um, going to build your, uh, your plan on this projection. On the projection a of 55%. school age increase in enrollment. Well, the proj what the projection allows us to do is know that at some point soon we're going to have to open more schools, right? It doesn't necessarily dictate the boundary and feeder pattern thing because what we don't we don't know exactly where those students are going to land just yet. Okay, but so that that awaits events. Yes. Okay. No, I just wanted to see how that yep. was working into it. All right. Uh, I do want to follow up a little bit now on um, the Healthy Schools Act. Sure. The Healthy Schools Act has lots of moving parts. Yes. It has uh, issues about, you know, nutrition, health education. It has, you know, school gardens, raising the nutrition level of the meals. But it also has something about uh, physical education sure. uh, requirements. And um, the uh, what, what I saw in the, um, in the responses, I understand, is that um, uh, and the – Healthy Schools Act requires DCPS to slowly increase PE um, and health education over a five-year period to reach the requirements set out in the in the Act by uh, 14 to 15. And DCPS uh, hasn't hasn't put itself in a position to do that, as I understand it. And yeah. I'd like to know why the statute says that's what you're supposed to do. And I guess you have to identify yourself if you're going to answer. Yeah. So um, I want to introduce John Davis. John Davis is my chief of schools, and he's led the scheduling work, in fact, that will allow us to get to the requirement that we need to on physical education. So I want to ask him to talk a little bit about that. That's right. This year, I mean, you mentioned 14-15. For the upcoming school year, 13-14, we're making sure in our scheduling document that it lays out exactly the amount of time that's needed. Because I think it's over a week. Um, where a number of minutes are needed, and then we'll call each school in to make sure that they are 
scheduling their students through different classes and, and ensuring that if the health, for instance, is in phys ed, that that's detailed out. If it's in science, we'll make sure that that's detailed out and make sure that we're, uh, we're conforming to all those requirements. So that you anticipate meeting the requirements. We are, we are working. To, we understand our obligation to meet the requirements, and we are, we've reorganized ourselves so that we can meet the requirements. And then you will report back to us yes. about how that's proceeding. Yep. Okay. Uh, I think now, you'll be pleased to see it over the next school okay. year. Okay. Well, great. Um, as to the food services, um, at the Committee of the Whole's December roundtable on food services, the DCPS was asked to explain why it ended up spending more money while serving fewer meals uh, than projected. And the response was, and this is a quote, most significantly there were dramatic changes resulting from the introduction of the Healthy Schools Act and additional requirements requested by DCPS Office of Food and Nutritional Services over the 2010-11 and 2011-12 years both impacted costs, unquote. And I want to follow up on that a little bit. The Healthy Schools Act was not in effect during the 2009-2010 school year. The cost per meal to DCPS that year, 2009-10, meaning the cost after, you know, reimbursement and revenue, was $1.62 per meal. That's in 2009-2010. During 2010-2011, that school year, the first, the first year of the Healthy Schools Act, the cost per meal to DCPS was $0.88. Cents. So before the Healthy Schools Act, it was $1.62 per meal. After the Healthy Schools Act, it was $0.88 cents per meal. If the cost of the DCPS and local funds dipped almost 50%, in the first year of the Healthy Schools Act, how does that reconcile with DCPS's claim that um, the Healthy Schools Act significantly increased costs? I'd like to know. That, that seems anomalous to me. Good afternoon. My name is Anthony de Guzman. I'm the Chief Operating Officer. Um, I recall in answering that question, we were trying to focus on the FY10-11 school year, but you just noted some FY9 information, is that correct? Right. Well, if you're going to cite that the Healthy Schools Act resulted in increased costs, I think it's fair to see what you were paying before the Healthy School, right before, the year before, which was yeah. $1.62 per meal, and then it went down to $0.88 cents per meal. Yeah, so I, I, I think that's a fair statement. What I'd like to do is go back and analyze it through that lens, because I don't believe that's the, that's the way we analyzed it in our response. Well, but it was an attempt to lay uh, the loss of money uh, to the Healthy Schools Act. So, well, yeah, I mean, uh, I understand. if you're not yeah. able to, to engage on that now, we can do that later. But I, I think that that bears some uh, airing out. Um, in its follow-up responses, DCPS indicated that the new fixed cost per meal, which is how we're doing it, will save the district $3 million. Um, and I want to know whether that takes into account the increase in federal re reimbursement rates, the likely increases in reimbursements due to community eligibility or increases in the meal price for, uh, for paying students? Yes. Okay. And, yes, and so what are does. you actually, so the combination of those adds up, I think, to two million. So let me give you a quick uh, year to date on our expenditures and revenue, if that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so, Chancellor, if you yeah. could just um, wrap this particular response up in the next minute or so. Uh, Ms. Chay, if you want to continue this on next round, happy to. Uh, but don't don't uh, don't stop Super. your answer. Give your answer, okay. but then no, we'll have one more round. Um, so we have reduced the overall loss um, so far this year by 4.5 million dollars. We can get you the backup documents, for, or we're on track to reducing by 4.5 million dollars. We've decreased our vendor expenses by the um, reorganization of the contract, and we are projecting a five th a five million dollar reduction in cost for this school year. And we've increased our revenue by three percent, in part. Um, by over $400,000 in part by the community eligibility option and in part um, by the reimbursement rates uh, that have increased as you, as you said. But overall, we are on track to saving more um, than we have in previous years. We will meet or exceed our, our savings goal that we set out on food services this year. Jay, we can come back to this. What I, what I have uh, come to understand is that the consolidation effort in and of itself uh, will stand to save us some money as much as three million dollars because we'll have fewer schools and fewer personnel 
Right, going forward, and, and, and I'm candidly focused on going on going forward, I, not to diminish the importance of getting the answers straight from the past, but yeah. going forward, if, because this has been a contract of concern, yeah. that the consolidation process will save us $3 million, that you know some of the things are related to healthy schools, which w we all support, uh, may contribute going sure. forward to the underlying cost of our program because our standards are higher than the That's minimum, right. which we all accept, embrace, and are thrilled yeah. with, because we have universal... Um, breakfasts without being means tested if we were to means test our breakfast you know then we could have some revenue there and if we increase the price of the food for those who can pay to a more um, you know to closer to the standard of what other jurisdictions pay yeah, we could raise right. more money there uh, nonetheless I think you know councilmember Che's attention on this contract is is important uh, and and the focus and the leadership she has demonstrated on uh, the Healthy School Act and making sure that our children are actually have, you know, a nutritious meal, that we are taking away the fried in the process and getting kids accustomed to eating food that is healthier for them. Uh, I, I don't, I don't suggest uh, to speak for her, but I know none of us are interested in de decreasing these standards or the offerings that we have. It's something that we should actually be very proud of, uh, especially as we confront, you know, hunger that exists in our city and the childhood obesity issue as well. So, but uh, we definitely do not want to be cheated. And I think this transformation into the fixed cost contract is going to be helpful. Uh, but nonetheless, it's, uh, it's, an, it's an important thing to, uh, to focus on. Uh, in my remaining uh, time, I want to uh, pivot uh, back again to the issue perhaps of Ellington. Um, you know, in our conversations with Principal Pollins, uh, you know, I shared your point of view, Ms. Che, that, you know, Ward 2 does not have uh, a single high school that is not application-based. So both Walls and Duke Ellington are application-based high schools. And so there's something seductive about looking at uh, Ellington, which used to be Western, and, and perhaps seeing can we reconstruct a, a non-application high school in the community. And just for, for benefit of members, uh, the, the explanation that I received from Principal Polins is because Ellington is a dual uh, instructional facility where there's both a heavy academic and ha heavy uh, performing arts component, that the, the children are there very early in the morning and they stay until very late. Mm -hmm. That the school, the school day itself doesn't end, if I'm not mistaken, until 5.30. Mm -hmm. And then their practice Four, begins. Six. And so the concern on the part of many of the children and the parents is that having children stay that late, you know, in another environment, in another part of the city, regretfully, would pose security risks. And so that's a consideration. Um, I'm, I, don't, uh, I don't like the fact that that is the reality, but that I thought it was important to put that explanation on the record. Um, Chancellor, I want to spend the remaining time that I have on the issue of spending. Uh, and I want to, you know, and, and this is to tee up a, or set the table for our performance, or for our budget hearing next month. Uh, you know, much as Ms. Che mentions, you know, Wilson was under budgeted $700,000 from a personal services uh, perspective in the most recent year, uh, and yet Baloo had, was over budgeted by a million in personnel. And so what we need to do going forward is we need to, again, I'm going to harp on this, we need greater transparency in mm -hmm. our budgets. And this isn't to suggest to pit one school against another. Sure. It's not only it, that means those are some there are resources that are needed in one part of the city, right, to, to educate children, and then there are resources that are absolutely not spent in another. Yes. So these so so having clear, more transparent budgets. And I understand that you've got a you know you're working within this uh, enrollment system the way it exists, where we do it once a year, and that you know there, it, 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 there isn't a perfect timing. But we have to be able to, to access information and know what every school is really getting, and we have to take on some of the additions because yeah. I'm not thrilled with the comprehensive staffing formula that has a, an average amount. I understand intuitively why you do it, but if some teachers in this school cost more than the others, it just it doesn't always work out. And when you start putting add-ons for special ed, you put add-ons for uh, substitutes, and then you take the money out. Whether or not those dollars are actually spent by that school, we don't know. Mm -hmm. right? Again, this is not a criticism. It's yep. just my desire to, for people to look at the budgets and know, and then we can start making uh, choices. There are a couple of just real quick items. One is, you know, the so-called unanticipated carryover of $5.3 million for attendance. Uh, we've known for a while that these were individuals that I, I understand you had recommended that we 
we uh, uh, downsize and yet they remain. And it isn't an effort to see people lose their work, but you know we're competing for resources, and you know if they are necessary for instruction, then let's let's have them. But oh, yeah, if no. they are not, then we've dealt with that they issue. Are not. Yeah. Right. Uh, I also have a difference. Uh, look at the uh, personnel budget for the PS category generally, and for the FY12 budget, you were approved for 497.9 million. It was revised up uh, to 509.3 but actually spent 495, which means there's $11.3 million that we have assigned to PS categories, but that we did not spend. And so going forward, you know, I'm going to be asking where these variances, what happens with these variances? Um, you know, and, and perhaps if Ms. Shepard wants to weigh in on this one, this is an illustration of how we're going to govern the committee going forward. Uh, Ms. Shepard, if you have an answer for that, I'd, I'd welcome it. I would respond briefly. What we found out last year was the first year we really started doing an in-depth forecast of what the expenditures will be, would be. Uh, at the end of the year, when we revisited the actual costs, we saw that surplus. Further analysis showed that we were budgeted at too high a rate for personal service for benefits. We have worked with the Office of Budget and Planning and to bring down that rate for the 14 budget, and we are looking at the 13 projections right now, so that may be part of the reprogramming that will be coming to you. We were just too high on benefits. So, so um, Ms. Shepard, I will be looking to you to help uh, make sure that our actual expenditures track the budget. All right, and as it applies to federal grants, as I look at the impact aid grant, you know, we had a budget of 1.6 million, but we expended none. Uh, the underspending in our Head Start programs by about 10 percent, and again, it's, uh, it, you, you can't have perfection in budgeting, but we're going to be benchmarking going forward our, our budgets tracking what we're spending, because if we're parking money where it shouldn't be, that's a problem. If we're not spending it, then we're not uh, we're not being, we're not being um, uh, wise u stewards of the money. Yes. So uh, the same also applies to private foundation grants, you know, and the management yes. of those. And so, you know, it's a bit beyond, um, you know, today's performance hearings, but I want to set the table for some of the questions we'll be looking for going forward, okay? Uh, in my remaining uh, uh, time, I want to thank the Chancellor for uh, her service and that of her team. And uh, Ms. Shepard, I'm delighted that you are, uh, have been assigned to the schools. We had a long working relationship when you were the CFO of the Human Services Cluster. So not only do um, you know, I have a nice uh, history with you and a, a great confidence in you. So I think we're now seeing the culmination of very talented people in this uh, in this regard. You and finance and the chancellor and instructions and management, uh, and we need to have the whole government um, rowing in the same direction. I don't mean to diminish the challenges that we have going forward. I think we all see the, the work that we have uh, uh, in store for us. But I, I keep referring to this as a pixelating system where there are pieces of this puzzle that you can see and we just need to bring it together. The concerns that were raised by the members, Chancellor, uh, I, I expect just as you did incorporate the concerns of the community in your testimony today, the budget that comes before this body next month, I would expect, will incorporate uh, the issues raised by the members. And so, and if you are unable to accommodate it, I would expect an explanation as to why. Um, and, and that will then help us as we begin to put the budget together. And again, the transparency means we are able to move money around. We're able to make sure it's linked to performance and excellence and the priorities that are reflected by the citizens who elect us and, and you who run the system. All right. Uh, thank you very much for your service. I'm going to go to, on the last round to Mr. Grasso. Mr. Grasso. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I just want to make a couple of comments, really. I, I think um, to, to start with, I just had the opportunity to meet with a, a class from the community college who are coming in now. Um, and I hope that, you know, it's, you know, that's one of my priorities is to make sure that we have a strong independent community college in D.C. Uh, I think it, it bolsters your work. It helps your work to have that in place. Uh, whether it be teachers coming out of there to help or, you know, support staff or uh, your students going in to get a degree. Right. And there's a couple of them here that are dual eligible. They're in the, they're in the, the high school program and as well as in the community college, which I think is just a dynamite thing to have that option. I also, I think 
they cleared up the regulation where the those that credits didn't count towards the high school and that's all cleared up now is that right yes, we've worked on that yes that's great um you know this uh this this whole day i've focused on on kind of planning and edu you know creating this space um it's something i'm never going to stop asking about mm -hmm. even if you think you've done it um, because for me uh, the concept and you've heard me say this over and over is to get as much information out to the people in the mm -hmm. city as we can um, I, you know, I heard you mention to Councilmember Che about the boundary. You know, that's a priority of mine to get that out in front. I will note that to do the study, you know, the consultant study and think about it is really helpful. I wouldn't wait to share that until after, you know, you've then had it in the task force. I, I this is just my thought on it. I would say, put that out in the community early, um, and then have the task force go around. Um, meeting with the community at that stage before they go and have a plan because then you'll get you may not get by and you're never going to get buy-in from everybody but sure. you can at least have a conversation that's valuable over the long run that you can really be you know to, to put something out and then have the conversation is not as good so let's have the conversation as quickly as possible um, the you know in the end um, we're all trying to create a great school system um, for our kids and that's what's most important um, and that's what I'm working towards with you as much as I can um, when you start putting together uh, more development in your plans and how it's coming out and outcomes I hope that you you know can report that to the committee as often as possible and certainly by the next by the budget hearings if we can have some updates on these kind of the yep. closing strategy how that's playing out and, mm -hmm. and really where we stand on that yeah um, is that we possible can, yeah we can add it to we put together a list of briefings that we can do for the council and we can add an update on the consolidation it doesn't have to be a long one yep. but I think no, some update on the kind of recruitment and retainment strategy sure enough um, and then you mentioned earlier that you have a a collaboration going on right now with the uh, you know between the charter school the you know the that's Aussie and other, yeah. uh, that's kind of a bigger picture planning I would also love to have um, you know an update on that as well uh, and I don't know how that's done and I don't want to step on your toes in this been or put you in charge if you're not and not. <laughs> yeah so I, I don't want to do it, that but you take it up with the deputy mayor's office mm -hmm. um, because they are responsible for coordinating amongst us but um, this is coming straight out of the mayor's office and the deputy mayor can the deputy mayor's office can provide updates on how that's going great uh, you know I, I can't encourage you enough to play an active role in that I'm and sure. to make sure that you know not that you have a choice but you know if, if you can you know get in there and really roll up your sleeves and creating that kind of collaboration and benchmarking and all that kind of stuff because that's how we're, I think we'll be successful sure um, and lastly I just want to echo I know the council member Che brought up the food issue um, mm -hmm. I've been researching that as well it baffles me and I'll just put that on the record how we can have a program that costs more uh, the way that this program does when there are programs out there that actually make money um, uh -huh. so I, I know you're working on it uh, that that is something that I'll be supportive in the effort on to try to see if we can clear that up and, and get it working right so we don't pay more than we should okay um, and that's all I have to say uh, to mr. chairman I am um, happy to, to be here and to be engaged in this issue and look forward to uh, high quality schools happening very soon thank you mr. Grasso mr. Barry Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and again, welcome to Chancellor here. I'm going to stay on this issue of disparity of highly proficient, proficient teachers, and those are highly inefficient. This is not an effort to pit Ward 3 against Ward 8. It's an effort to bring about some equity mm -hmm. and bring about some equality of uh, standards about this. Let me give you some numbers again. And Ms. J, I'm not picking on War Three. I'm just stating what already is there. If you look at the highly perfected, te perfect, highly proficient teachers, War Three have 41 percent. Again, I'm not picking on War Three. I'm just contrasting it. War Eight had 9.4 percent. If you track it educationally, you will find those schools that have the most highly proficient teachers generally had the highest achievement in reading and math. Now, I know well enough to know, Mr. Saunders, that just because you're a highly efficient teacher in, say, Ward 3, 
and you go over to Ward 8, if you're not culturally competent, you still can't make it. I understand that. It's harder teaching a third grader, a fifth grader, a seventh grader, eleventh grader in a low in a uh, low income community than it is to teach in a non low income community, middle class, black or white, because they offer the support system. So, chance I'm going to stay on this uh, with you as to what you intend to do to bring about this equality, and also demonstrate very clearly that the union contract does not affect entering teachers before they enter. You know what makes charter schools uh, much better like HIP and others? It's not just the longer school day. It's the quality of the educational system, mm -hmm. the teachers. They, they are, their, their standards are much higher than ours. I know I've talked to enough of them. The standards at, at uh, Thurgood Marshall in terms of hiring teachers is much higher than at Anacostia. Blue. I know that already. And also I know that it doesn't take money to make schools inviting. When you go into KIPP and some other schools, charter schools, achievement prep, and et cetera, they are inviting to students. Mm -hmm. And what is it that makes students line up outside of Thurgood Marshall? You go by there every morning, 7, 7.30, you find students lined up, ready to go. Not everybody, but enough. Same thing is true at KIPP, achievement prep. Now, all of our charter schools are not high quality. We have a few that uh, need to be closed uh, sometime soon. And so I'd like for you to think about that. That along with school day, Mr. Chairman, is not the only factor. I know it's not. I've talked with it. Also, Madam, Madam Chancellor, you talking individually to Chantel Wright may be helpful, but it's not enough. It seems to me you are together. All of the high school uh, principals and the assistant principals uh, in each of these wards and sit down with the high schools that are charter mm -hmm. and find out more specifically, what did you do? For instance, I know KIPP has a program of on the bench for discipline. Mm -hmm. You don't take the child, the student, out of the classroom because you're self-defeating yourself. Mm -hmm. But he stays in the classroom and she stays in the classroom, has to sit at the back of the class mm -hmm. and cannot speak to anybody in the class except to the teacher. Mm -hmm. And if you speak, if a person like, say, Shante speaks to me up on the bench, then she gets on the bench. Mm -hmm. So that work, it was, it was, it was awful at first. They, they, they just had, had nothing but chaos because people just wouldn't do it. But not last time I checked on it with Susan, it's working very well. Mm -hmm. The other charter schools that have various kinds of, uh, uh, discipline. We uh, talked. We Wait talked to Thurgood Marshall about a Ward Eight consortium. Madam Chancellor, we talked about that. No, let me, let okay. me finish, please. Thank you. You know, now we talked about it. What I'm saying is that there has to be some systematic, structured kind of meetings where your team, top at the bottom, mm -hmm. and the principals in, in in the Ward Eight charter schools, and the principals in Ward Eight uh, tr traditional schools. I think it'd be segmented by high schools, middle schools, and elementary because the problems in, in elementary are different than the, the problems in high school, et cetera. So that's why I, I don't need an answer on that. I want to put that on your on your on your plate. Can I just say okay. one thing about that? Yeah. I just want to say we talked to Thurgood Marshall about doing that exact thing and we have plans to bring the principals together. That's all. That's the problem. We talked about it. Well no, you have you can't you can't bring the principals second. together and say you even Chancellor. For yeah. two years. For two years. And a little change. You know, two years, and this is no criticism, this is an analysis, for two years you've been there. And mm -hmm. it seems to me that these kind of discussions should have started a year and a half ago. But it's all right. No problem. At least you're going to get around to them. I'm trying to give us a proactive okay. effort to, to do that. So I'm going to leave that alone. Now I'm going to talk about special education, Mr. Chairman. I have data here which shows that FY12, you had $112 million in the uh, student formula budget. You had an approved budget of $134 million, revised budget of $126 million. Actually, expenditures in 12 was $87 million, Mr. Chairman, that there was $26 million of underspending 
and in terms of the student formula, and forty-six million dollars underspent in the approved budget. The bottom line is that gross funds was one hundred and sixty million dollars. Revised budget uh, was one hundred fifty-four million dollars. The actual expenditures was a hundred and sixteen million dollars, and it's thirty-nine million dollars left unspent. Can the Lord can you explain that very quickly? Why we got those numbers? They came out of the from Mary Levy in the budgets. Well, um, quickly come Council on, Council Member. I'd like to see those numbers because I'm showing that we spent how much almost 124 million in special ed from all sources for fiscal year 12. So we can probably, you know, do a reconciliation. But what do you have now? We're all sources. All sources, 124 million. How much did you spend? That was the expenditure, 124 million. How much is in the local budget? The local budget is 51 million. How much is the total budget, local budget? Combined, we spend 125. I didn't million. ask you that. I asked you the local budget. How much was in the budget? For 50 my local million fund? was in the local budget. How much? 50 million, and we spent it all. And in the in the non-local budget, it was 71 million revised, and we spent it all. Is it true that you had an approved budget and gross funds of 160 million dollars? The, uh, the revised budget was 154. You had those figures? I don't have those figures in front of me. Well, let me leave this way, Mr. Chairman. If all of this money is left unspent. And every time we talk with the chancellor, they we need more resources most of the time. But I, I don't have time to do it right here. But they were not local dollars. They are federal dollars no which we can carry into the next Mr. Chairman, do you understand this? If a budget is $160 million and part of that is funding from the federal government and we don't spend most of that with the idea we can carry it over, something is wrong with that picture. All right, I'm going to leave it at that. Something is wrong with that picture. We must be able to budget and we have resources. This school district would like to have this kind of resource. Most school districts in the urban cities don't have these kind of resources. Can, we come, over? Can we minute. come over and reconcile our okay. numbers with yeah, you? No, we're going to do that. No question about that. Okay. Uh, but I'm and making a point that that doesn't happen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a lot of questions about food service, but I don't have time to uh, ask them, except why is there declining uh, uses in our local schools of the food? What are you doing about it? A declining in what? Yeah. You're serving less meals now. Uh, also, let me just add this right quick. Uh, before, where's that, where's that chart? Be before... The Health and Food Act. We were spending fourteen. Why don't we come on? We can come over and review food the food services. So the public can see okay. that. We're spending fourteen million dollars. Then we got two and nine and ten. We spent ten million dollars. Now we projected to go up to fourteen million dollars of expenditures. And finally, Mr. Chairman, before this council, the Montgomery County people, the Fairfax County people. And all the other school districts in this region uh, were either breaking even or making money. And so we need to know we, why it is that it's creeped up to $14 million. Okay. Well, my, my time is running. It's run out almost. Can I get that last question, Mr. Chairman? If, if uh, the Chancellor will please answer Mr. Barry's last question, I'll then go on to Ms. Che. Yeah. I can't answer it in 29 seconds, so doctor, we can yeah, come over and take your time. We, um, so, I'm sorry, the question is why are we spending less on, the, num the numbers that you're saying don't sound familiar to me. The $14 million sounds like what we requested in the supplemental, so I'm not exactly sure what, I'm not, yeah. For, for FY13, we projected, for 12 last year, we projected at spending 14, losing 14 million dollars, and in 10, we only lost 10 million dollars. The question is, what keep this price up? 
So I'm sorry. Our total expenditures for FY12 were $41 million, 27.3 million, $27 million in original costs, and then 14.3 million in the supplemental. In the FY13 budget, we're projecting our spend at $35.9 million, which is actually a decrease in part because we've restructured the contract and because we've increased our How much revenue. loss. So. In 12, we had a loss of 8.16. We're projecting a loss of 3.62 this year. We also decreased vendor expenses by 20%. Last year, $20.5 million. This year, $16.4 million. We've also reduced the cost per meal, and we're looking at a $5 million reduction in cost this year. We also increased our revenue by 3%. Over $400,000, from $12.39 million to $12.80 million, um, in part by That's adopting okay, community I think that's the gist of it. But um, we'll do the same thing with that. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Barry. Yeah. If, if, if I might make a suggestion, and this is maybe not on this issue, but on the previous one where you were asking about numbers, I, I suspect you're reading numbers, Mr. Barry, out of the budget book, which is somewhat different than the way the DCPS accounts for their money. And so that's part of the process, that you need almost uh, an enigma to go from one to the other. And again, we're not, this is just where we are. That's what we're trying to work through. And so, we're, so when you look at your budget book, when you rely on that, that's not the way their budget is organized. It should be, but it isn't. And what we're going to focus on is improving this going forward. Okay? But the idea of highly proficient teachers has nothing to do with budget. Oh, thank you, Mr. Perry. No. Um, we will now go to Ms. Che. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Ms. Che. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I do want to follow up on this. Um, the figures I have for the local fund subsidy for the food uh, uh, program is 11-12 um, was 14.35 million, 10-11 was 10 million, um, and yeah. it can go back to the other years as well. Yeah. And then um, in this year, uh, I understand you're saying that you're going to save five million uh, dollars, and I'm trying to see where that five million comes from. It looks to me like uh, at least two million of it are reimbursements or increases uh, of students who pay for meals, uh, monies that we would have gotten anyway, that not to be attributed to the to the, the fixed price uh, contract, um, so that they would have been savings anyway because we're getting more money from these other sources, not from local funds. And then uh, it looks like three million at most is what you think you're saving from uh, this new fixed price contract. But I'd like to have some information about why you're saving that. Um, do you think that the meal counts in 12-13 are going to be higher or lower than they were in 11-12? I'll answer that. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can um, hear you now. Thank you. Um, we think the meal counts are going to be consistent from uh, last year. So we're, we're trending at pretty much the same participation rate as we did last year. Okay. So there'll be no reduction in the number of meals served? That's correct. Okay. And then um, in terms of the, I want to clarify um, one of the Chancellor's statements. She was quoting some numbers that we are using um, to compare last year to date as of uh, January 31st of 2012 to what we're finding in our invoices of as of January 1st, 2013. Well, can I and get a clear statement then? Are you saving $5 million over the local fund subsidy this year as compared to last? Is that, um, is as that of right? January, based on our invoices, last year, January, uh, we, had we had lost over $8 million as of uh, January 31st. This year, based on our invoices, that loss is $3.6 million. So we're seeing, you know, upwards of $4.5, $5 million. So the projected. local fund subsidy for this year will be around $7 million. If we continue to trend this way, yes, yeah, somewhere Some, in the somewhere neighborhood of a little north of $7 million. Now, so, uh, and you're, you're saying that this um, savings results from uh, the change from the contract we had prior to this fixed uh, price contract, correct? I believe so, yes. Okay. Um, now, for example, in some of the follow-up responses, you indicated the cost of a supper meal to be between $2.95 and $3.89. Uh, can you just tell me how you can have a supper meal at that price? How do we arrive at those numbers? Well, we through the RFP last year, we Because submitted. I understand some of these suppers, so the people don't think that they're having like a nice, you know, roast beef with potatoes. I mean, it's a 
turkey sandwich and, and an apple in a bag, or so, isn't it? No, something I like believe that? it's more than that. In fact, I'd share with the chancellor a photograph of a burrito not long ago. A um, burrito, many right? Other Two nine five three eight nine. With with fruits and vegetables around it. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it was we provided the requirements, USDA HSA requirements, as part of the RFP mm -hmm. process, and these were the prices that the vendors came back. Okay, and and you all said that you were still researching the staffing practices of similarly situated food service operations. Have you looked at St. Paul, Minnesota, Memphis, Tennessee, or even Montgomery County, but those other two are large urban districts. They have comparable percentages of students with free and reduced lunches, and they, they either break it even or make a profit. Yes, and I've, I personally visited Minnesota, and they, they, it's not, a, I wouldn't say it's entirely comparable. You're right about the free and reduced meal and the size, but there are some differences in terms of how we operate. In the millions of dollars? Well, there are also differences in terms of the standards we're trying to meet. So, you know, what we've been doing over the last uh, couple of months is working with the city administrator. As you know, they're putting together a report. They've worked with the Council of Great City Schools and other local right. um, municipalities to, to look at how they're running their food service so that we can learn from those experiences. Well, I hope that some of the savings doesn't come from a change in the product. Um, for example, DCPS, as I understand it, recently stopped serving Stonyfield organic yogurt in favor of Trix yogurt. Trix yogurt contains RBGH, which is a growth hormone that's been banned in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Japan, and the European Union. Do you know why we switched from Stonyfield organic yogurt to Trix yogurt? Well, I believe it's Dan and yogurt, but um, what we what we did is we provided our vendors with standards, and particularly the standard around sugar being the second ingredient. And that yogurt that you reference actually meets our standards. And, is um, the Trix yogurt cost less than the Stonyfield yogurt? I'm not sure. I'd have to get back to you about that. Uh huh. Um, in any event, uh, but I would believe it would. But again, it it. it we're having conversations internally about the standards we set and what sort of outcomes they may result in. But because that would be pretty they, worrisome to me. Technically, they do these. The project you referenced meets the standards that we put uh -huh. out, and we used last year as well. Okay, and uh, you know when you look at these other jurisdictions that either break even or make money, and I know Chancellor, you said food service is not a core competency, but. I take it that this year you're going to need money from the local fund subsidy, and next year you're going to need money from the local fund subsidy in some millions of dollars. So if other jurisdictions can break even or even make money, shouldn't we try to recover those some millions of dollars mm -hmm. for the school system? Yes. We and I've been, do, I've been at this for years, as you well know, mm -hmm. and there's been a great resistance to do anything in-house. And so now maybe we'll go through DGS or something like that. But I, I just cannot understand why there's this great unwillingness, and there has been all along the way, to even start a little pilot project. Because, Council Member Che, this is not something that we've never done before. In fact, we had food services in-house, and the quality of the food was bad, our management of it was bad, and we were spending a lot of money. When we look at um, the Council for Great City Schools, Mike Casserly, I'm saying to him, listen, you look at all of the urban school systems. He says, look, the people who are making money are not serving the healthy foods that you all are serving. Oh, that's serving. not correct. I don't and think so Montgomery County is serving them crap. So, well, the, pro the problem is, though, Montgomery County is a much larger system than we are. And just like you see efficiencies at scale in schools, you see the same thing here. We want to get to the same place, same Council Member Memphis. I don't want to I don't want to serve bad food and I don't want to lose money on food. But I also don't want to focus my staff's attention on food to the detriment of all of the instructional work. You've heard Council Member Barry show how far we have to go and and we don't creating have the capacity a straw to man do, or straw person. we don't have the capacity to do everything everything well, Council Member Chase. So I'm trying to be strategic in what we focus our attention on. That's all and nothing else. Well, it seems to me that you're creating, you know, uh, a, a dichotomy here that doesn't exist. Either we do this or we do that. Well, I think we, this is why the, the city is looking at it to see who else could help us with this. St. Paul, Minnesota has 40,000 in its enrollment. We have 43 in DCPS. Um, it has 72 percent of free and reduced rate uh, meals, we have 70%. There are other comparables, and somehow, miraculously, 
I don't believe that their uh, education system has uh, uh, fallen uh, and, and they're not uh, educating their children. So uh, it's, they're not, a, they're it's an unwillingness, them. really, to... to, to well, I'm, I'm sorry that you feel that way. We flew Anthony to St. Paul to try to figure out what was going on. And so I'm happy to have him come and brief you and talk about what he saw. And I, I visited some other districts as well. No pun intended, but I think we need to be very careful about comparing apples to apples because some of the school districts you mentioned are dissimilar to us. They have far less free and reduced meals. They charge, I just said they charge significantly more for, for, for foods. And you know, I actually just the other day I was going through a web search of uh, other menus. And there are school districts that we've used, you've used in your comparisons, I won't name which, uh, that you know, are serving Cheetos and you know, serving or tricks candy. Or tricks. Can I, there's no comparison between those two, but uh, candy and, and cookies and charging pretty significant prices for this. So we're in a very different situation uh, compared to those school districts. So there's, it's hard to compare us apples There's to apples. always been an unwillingness to take this on. And the big increases in cost, the big increases in cost, aside from the Healthy Schools Act, because the Healthy Schools Act, you had a reduction in the price per meal, came when we outsourced this, when Mayor Fenty decided he wanted to separate that out from the school system. Anyway, I have no further questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Che. Um, Chancellor, we are now at the final moments of the hearing. I want to give you an opportunity, if there are any other items that you'd like to bring to the committee's attention, uh, to give you a final uh, opportunity to make those points, and then we will adjourn this meeting and reconvene uh, next month in an appropriation setting. So I don't have any other items. I do want to um, thank the Education Committee and the Council for providing us with the opportunity to share a little bit about what happened last year. I think that we are continuing um, to see success. We still have a long way to go and we have a lot to build on, but I think in partnership with the Council, um, we will get to where we're going. So thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Berry had one final comment. Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Again, Madam Chancellor, you and I have frequent conversations, and I want to thank you for your diligence, your, your commitment to this city and to the children. And just because we may ask a couple questions, does not mean that we don't have equally to share that. So thank you. Thank you to Lois for get, helping to give us out of this financial mess. Thank you very, very much. And thank you, staff at thank the school you. system and in the CFO's office. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barry. Uh, Chancellor and Ms. Shepard, uh, thank you very much for your. Uh, 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 answering our questions today and for the uh, documentation you provided the committee in advance of this in response to our questions. Uh, and at uh, 2.40, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Dolores, can you come in?